Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Southwest Drought Virtual Forum. My name is Karina Barr, and I will be providing technical support during the session today. And before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's virtual event. Let's take a quick look at the GoToWebinar control panel that's in your browser. You have joined the presentation listening through your computer speaker system. Your default speaker is automatically selected, but you can click the settings icon and choose another speaker device. Next, click on the question icon to submit questions and comments. We will be addressing them during each segment. And if you have any technical difficulties, you can type them here as well, and I will be happy to assist you. During the, each presentation, we will provide you with hyperlinks to any speaker materials. These links will appear in your questions box. And please know that for this four-day forum, today's session is the only day being recorded. And finally, we encourage you to close any tabs in your browser except the GoToWebinar one. And if you have any trouble viewing the session, you can refresh your browser to update it. I would now like to introduce your moderator for the forum, Viva De Haza, NIDAS Executive Director. Welcome, Viva. Thanks, Karina, and welcome everyone um, to this to the forum. Um, my name again is Viva De Haza, and I am the Executive Director of NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System Program, otherwise known as NIDIS. For those of you who are uh, somewhat unfamiliar with NIDIS, uh, NIDIS was established by Congress in 2006 by public law and was reauthorized twice with strong bipartisan support in 2014 and 2019. NIDIS's mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risks by providing those affected with the best available information and resources to assess the potential for drought and to better prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought. I would like to thank everyone who worked to put this forum together, including a fantastic planning committee who helped shape and scope this event with us. You can find their names, along with much more about this forum, on the forum's website, www.southwestdroughtforum.com, which is also provided to you in the chat box. If you would like to join the conversation throughout the forum, we are on Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag Southwest Drought Forum, and that is also in the chat box for you as well. The goals of this forum are first to bring people together to discuss long-term drought issues in the Southwest. Over the next four days, we will be confronting head-on some of the issues related to this drought. We will look at current conditions and to understand the evolving drought risks in the Southwest. We will ask if more opportunities exist. When it comes to prolonged drought, what are the current efforts and outstanding needs? We will focus on future thinking, decision-making in the face of a new paradigm. We will talk about addressing growing challenges and interconnectedness of drought, wildfires, and other hazards, and develop a shared vision for moving forward together in a changing environment. With that, I am thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce the NOAA Administrator, Dr. Rick Spinrad, to officially open this forum. Dr. Spinrad, welcome. Thank you, Viva, for that very kind introduction. And, and I want to thank you all for participating in this timely discussion. It really is an honor, uh, as one of my first acts as NOAA Administrator, to be addressing so many of the people who really care so deeply about and are so knowledgeable about the most critical natural resource to the southwestern United States, namely water. I've also got to point out that this is personal for me for two reasons. One is, uh, I just moved from my home in the high desert of Oregon. Uh, it's not the Southwest, but I think many of you know that the high desert of Oregon is also subject to extreme drought and fires right now. So I can relate personally to many of the issues that you'll be discussing. It's also personal for me because as Viva described in the history of NIDIS and NOAA's treatment of drought and drought information, I was uh, the head of NOAA's research office when we started to develop NIDIS and when NIDIS was officially authorized uh, by Congress. So I have a, a personal attachment to a lot of the subjects that you'll be talking about. Many of you call the Southwest home. Uh, water scarce and therefore sacred in your communities. 
And over the past year, you've helped your communities respond to and adapt to relentless drought. The impacts have been felt by agricultural producers, rural communities, water providers, tribal nations, and small businesses have been devastated. Drought has become an all too familiar phenomenon. Long-term drought in the Southwest is not only a regional concern, but a key issue of national significance. Like I said, I've lived in the West for many years and I've seen the impacts of drought and wildfire in my own backyard. The West is interconnected and we cannot tackle the challenges presented by long-term drought in the Southwest as a regional issue alone. Let me say a word about the context of this forum. The forum is bringing together decision makers across levels of government, non-governmental organizations, private sector, academia, and scientists who are contributing to our understanding of long-term drought. Each of you has a vital role to play in helping to build a broad network of communities that will be needed to tackle the challenges before us. Today's focused on science and setting the historical stage for how we understand these evolving drought risks in the Southwest. To meet these challenges, which are exacerbated by increasing populations, as well as climate change, we need sound scientific information to stretch our water resources further while we also protect livelihoods and ecosystems. NOAA's world-class earth system and climate science supports vital drought products and services. Over the past two decades, first as head of NOAA's Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, and then as NOAA's chief scientist, and now as NOAA's administrator, I have had the privilege to contribute to many of these critical advancements for drought. Today, our agency is mobilizing for a more arid Southwest by actively engaging in providing early warnings and timely and relevant information to ensure that policymakers make informed decisions with an accurate assessment of the landscape. I would like to impress upon you my main priorities for NOAA and how they tie into the work being done at this very forum. My three main priorities for NOAA are first, establishing NOAA as the authoritative source for what I call mission agnostic climate products and services, and expanding and improving our climate products and services. Secondly, fostering economic development in balance with environmental stewardship. And finally, ensuring equitable development and distribution of climate products and services. You can think of these as the three S's and the three E's. The three S's are science, service, and security, expanding, improving climate products and services. We're talking about the role science plays in supporting services and security. NOAA is actively working with our federal partners and the broader community to establish our role as the authoritative source for mission agnostic climate data and services. For decades, NOAA has provided the best available scientific information, tools, and services on weather and climate to build a resilient nation. My goal is to expand and improve on this tremendous foundation, and this forum is doing just that for drought. As our drought observing capabilities continue to expand, and we strengthen our forecasting capabilities to seasonal and sub-seasonal timescales, we can improve our future drought decision support services and deliver earlier warnings of drought to communities nationwide. The three E's, environment, economy, equity, and the role of science in all three, fostering economic development in balance with environmental stewardship. According to NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information, droughts cost the US an average of $6.3 billion annually. These figures use the best available information on agricultural losses, but we know that drought touches many other vulnerable areas of our economy. A critical need for drought early warning is the ability to quantify and predict droughts impact on sectors such as recreation, tourism, industry, uh, energy industry, and manufacturing. Investments in research to better understand these impacts will enable decision makers to quantify, stratify, and ensure economic risks of drought, pivot decision trade-offs as impacts evolve, and build back better after drought events. Being part of the Department of Commerce, NOAA has a responsibility to help communities better understand the economic risks of drought and other natural hazards, while also supporting communities adjusting to changes to their traditional livelihoods. Equitable development and distribution of climate products and services. 
I was very pleased to see this forum's focus on capturing community impacts and needs, especially those of often underserved rural areas, as well as tribal communities. These communities are on the front lines of climate change, and we must put the full weight of all of NOAA behind them. We're involved in co-development and are committed to defining requirements and needs most equitably and to using traditional ecological knowledge as an important component of our research and development. Let me talk in closing about NOAA's role on drought and the importance of collaboration. According to the 2018 National Climate Assessment, high temperatures are projected to worsen the intensity, duration, and frequency of drought over the coming decades in the Western US. The work being captured at this forum couldn't be any more timely. My hope from this forum is that we tackle some of the most pressing issues we face in the Southwest and that we get clarity on next steps. Through NIDIS, NOAA has proudly supported national drought forums in 2012 and 2019, and they've been valuable opportunities to address issues and put solutions in place. The 2012 forum in particular led to the creation of the National Drought Resilience Partnership in 2013. It is through the NDRP that NOAA and other federal agencies have ensured that drought response and resilience efforts are coordinated and guided by the best available data, research, and information, and that policymaking and scientific research advance aggressively, hand in hand with each other. So we take these engagements very seriously. I applaud your efforts and look forward to advancing them further. I will stand ready to leverage our interagency partnerships further as we take an all of government approach to addressing the climate crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Spinrad. I um, appreciate all of the remarks. I think you have set us off on a good course for the rest of the four days and the robust discussions that we're going to have. Um, so let's go ahead and move forward in the agenda um, to the net, to the, our first panel, if you will. Today we will hear about the 2021 Western drought. What are our current conditions? We will then set the stage to understand how we got here and then hear about sector and community-based perspectives on cascading drought impacts and needed changes. We will close out with an analysis of the impact of drought on agriculture, local economies, public health, and crime across the Western US, United States. The first panel in today's forum will be focused on drought conditions and forecasts and the seasonal fire outlook. We will first hear from a group of experts who will provide us with current drought and fire conditions in the Southwest. Following the presentations, there will be a few minutes for Q&As. Please feel free to type your question into the questions box as you would like it to be read. Include your name and affiliation. We will not have time to answer all questions, but we'll select a few and read them for the panelists to answer. So with that, I am grateful to be able to introduce our speakers for this first panel. Richard Heim is a US Drought Monitor author and a meteorologist in the climate monitoring section of NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information. Dave DeWitt is the director of NOAA's Climate Prediction Center in NOAA's National Weather Service. And Jim Wallman is from the Department of the Interior's Bureau of Land Management. I will first turn it over to Richard Heim. Richard? Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here. I will be talking about the condi current conditions and historical perspective of the drought in the West. I have a lot of slides, so some of these I will be going through fairly quickly. The current conditions based upon the September 14, the latest US drought monitor for the Western US shows about 89% of the region in drought, that's D1 to D4, moderate drought to exceptional drought, with more than half, 53%, in extreme to exceptional drought, the two worst categories. And based upon the dues regions, 100% of the California Nevada dues is in drought, 81% of the Intermountain West dues in drought, 94% of the Pacific Northwest, and 65% of the Missouri River Basin dues. Uh, next slide, please. 
There have been a number of drought impacts resulting from the drought that we've been having this year and last year and really over many years. They include agricultural impacts, economic ecosystems, water resources impacts, low stream flows, elevated fire danger, recreation. They're almost endless and here are some sample pictures of what some of these impacts look like. I won't dwell on them in this talk since we'll be talking about this kind of stuff later in the workshop. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, the bullets here I'll be talking about in another slide, but the main thing I wanted to emphasize here is that the drought that has been developed over the last two years is essentially a result of lack of precipitation. The summer monsoon in 2019 was pretty weak. The, winter, the following winter, 2019-2020 winter, also not very much precipitation. The next summer, which would be last summer, 2020, the summer monsoon completely failed. The following winter, which was last winter, 2020 to 2021, we really had a failure of the winter precipitation. So two summer monsoon seasons, two winter wet seasons, below normal precipitation, well below normal precipitation. This summer, the summer monsoon, monsoon returned to the Southwest, but gosh, you're looking at years and years of below normal precipitation, one wet summer monsoon isn't really going to make up for these, this deficit. And also it was unusually dry in the Pacific Northwest. Next slide. So how dry was it? We look at the statewide average temperature uh, precipitation values for these various time periods for the last 12 months through June. This is before this summer's monsoon kicked in. The 12-month precipitation for July 2020 through June 2021 was record dry. Record dry 12 months for California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona. The 18 months from January 2020 to June 2021, record dry for Nevada, Utah, Arizona, third driest California, Colorado. The last 24 months, July 2019 through June 2021, still record dry for Nevada and Utah, second driest for California, fourth driest Colorado, sixth driest Arizona, seventh driest New Mexico. So we're looking at some really dry, record dry conditions. Next slide. Okay, let's incorporate this summer's monsoon precipitation. Statewide precipitation ranks as of August 2021 through the end of last month. Still, the last 12 months, September 2020 through August 2021, still record dry California, still second driest in Nevada, and a little bit better in Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, but still in the driest third. The last 18 months, March 2020 to August 2021, still second driest Nevada and Utah, fourth driest California, Colorado. And the 24 months, September 2019 to August 2021, still second driest California, still second driest in Utah, even with the abundant precip that they've been getting the past three months, third driest Nevada. Fourth dry is Colorado. Next slide, please. Okay, let's look at temperature. Precip is only one half of the drought equation. The drought is basically an imbalance between water supply and water demand. Precipitation is water supply, low precip drought. Evapotranspiration is water demand side. Temperature is an important factor in that. Higher temperatures, more demand, more drought or exacerbating drought. And we've had warmer than normal conditions during this period, the last two years especially. Record-breaking heat accompanied the Southwest monsoon failure in 2020, and record heat occurred in the Pacific Northwest in early summer 2021, and across much of the West for June to August 2021. And the excessive heat has led to excessive evapotranspiration as well. Next slide. Okay, drier than normal and warmer than normal conditions during the last two winters resulted in poor winter and spring mountain snowpack and early melt. And of course, the mountain snowpack is an important factor in replenishing reservoirs and providing 
the water supply during spring and summer dry season and the uh, mountain snowpack as of April 1, 2019, two years ago, was pretty good because we had an El Nino. But then the 2020 April 1 snow water equivalent mountain snowpack was near to below normal and even worse this past April 1. Next slide, please. And of course, this has been reflected in reservoir levels, increased water demand, lack of precipitation, and lack of spring mountain snowpack, snow melt for the last two years has depleted the reservoirs. Three, two years ago, September 1, 2019, only two states had below average reservoir levels averaged across the state. That increased to six the, on the, by September 1, 2020, and now only two of the Western states have a near to above normal, really near normal, reservoir levels statewide as of September 1, 2021, just a few weeks ago. So this has been a, a serious situation. The drought, even though we've been having some good summer monsoon precip, it hasn't done a whole lot to replenish these reservoirs. Next slide. Richard, uh, pardon the interruption, you have three minutes left. I have three minutes, oh my. Soil moisture, a lot of uh, indicators. I'll, uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, USDA CASMA. And next slide. The soil moisture has been decreasing, has been really dry. Top soil moisture uh, during this entire period, especially in the southwest for, uh, corner states. Next slide. And this shows how the drought has expanded over the last two years starting in the southwest, expanding across the west with the dry summer monsoons and dry winters. Next slide. The percent area of the west reached a record in 2021, 90.3% in D1 to D4 this past July 27, reached the record in 2003, and D3, D4, 59.5%. July 20 beats the record from 2002. This is the U.S. Drought Monitor 20-year record. Next slide. The VHI from Nest to Star for the last 40 years shows much of the last 20 years in drought. Uh, next slide. The Palmer Drought Index goes back to 1900. We also set a record for the percent area of the West shown in the graphic on the upper right as the region. 99% of this region at the end of June was in moderate to extreme drought. That beat the record from 1934. Next slide. Temperature and precipitation. We had the driest April through June uh, this year. I'm sorry, the warmest April through June this year and the second driest averaged across the West. July 2019 to June 20. 21 was the driest such 24 month period on record westwide and the fifth warmest. Next. And this past summer, the warmest June to August on record averaged across the West. Next slide. The SPEI integrates temperature and precipitation and the combination of temperature and precip extremes has resulted in record to near record low SPEI values at various time scales over the last 20 years. And this is the 12 month SPI, SPEI. If you look at the next slide, if you integrate this over the last six years, we have um, the cumulative effect of the current con of these conditions repeated year after year over the last 20 years does not bode well for the West, especially California, Nevada, and, and Arizona, where it's perpetual drought based upon this SPEI for over a six year period going back the last 10 to 20 years. Next slide. So the conclusions, the current drought conditions in the Southwest and Westwide have arisen from excessive record dryness and heat of the last two years, especially the failure of the summer monsoon and winter precipitation. The current drought is occurring within a broader context of a two decade long drought episode in the West and temperature and precipitation trends over the last 20 to 40 years indicate a changing hydrology, which makes the region more prone to drought. And that concludes this presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Richard. Um, great presentation. Not um, not a lot of great news there, though. Um, so let's go ahead and um, and before I move on and to hear from Dave DeWitt with the climate outlook, um, let me just remind folks that again that we are going to have a about a 10 minute uh, opportunity at the end of these presentations to to take some questions. So a reminder again, if you have a question, um, please put it in the in the questions box along with your name and your um, affiliation, and then we can read we can uh, choose the questions to read out. So um, Dave DeWitt, you are up next. Great, thanks, Viva. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can't see your your camera. I don't know if you want to turn your camera on or not. It's up to you, but just we can't hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. Yeah, no camera due to the flood damage, unfortunately, in the house. My apologies on that. So, um, so I'm going to briefly discuss the major climate forcings for the upcoming fall and winter, and the associated outlooks from the National Weather Service Climate Prediction Center for drought, temperature, and precipitation. Next, I will discuss major science gaps in our ability to predict the onset and termination of drought. And finally, I will briefly describe a collaborative project between the Climate Prediction Center and the National Integrated Drought Information System, NIDAS, to improve our existing drought outlooks. Next slide. So the major short-term climate driver that will impact southwestern drought this fall and winter is La Nina. La Nina conditions are indicated by below normal sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern tropical Pacific and is typically associated with an enhanced probability for below normal precipitation for much of the southwest during the fall and winter seasons. Next slide. So the Climate Prediction Center official outlook for this fall calls for an enhanced probability of above normal temperature and below normal precipitation for most of the southwest U.S. As Richard mentioned, warmer temperatures generally lead to enhanced evaporation, so both the temperature and precipitation outlooks are favoring enhancement, sustainment, or development of drought for the southwest this fall. Next slide. So the CPC official outlook for winter tells a very similar story to that for the fall, with an enhanced likelihood for above normal temperature and for below normal precipitation for much of the Southwest, again, favoring sustainment, development, or intensification of the drought currently existing in the Southwest US. Next slide. So the US seasonal drought outlook underscores the point that we expect drought to continue, intensify, or develop over most of the Southwest US this fall into winter. Next slide, yep. So, I would like to speak about some science gaps in our ability to predict drought. So in this case, I am speaking to the onset of flash drought. And as an example, I'm going to use the case of the 2017 flash drought that occurred in the Northern Plains. So this drought onset, you can see this red ellipse here over about a 60 day period and state of the art models were only able to predict the onset of this drought at about one to two weeks lead. That's all models around the world, right? So that's the US model, the European model, the UK, Matt, Canadian. Everybody's in the same boat when it comes to uh, inability to predict subseasonal to seasonal precipitation on time scales beyond about two weeks. I do want to comment that Andy Hole, who I believe is a panelist on this, who I know is a panelist on, uh, in this meeting, and his colleagues conducted a beautiful study for NIDIS that looked at the predictability and uh, predictive skill that was manifest for this event. And I strongly encourage people to read that report if you haven't seen it already. Next slide. So next I'm gonna speak about the rapid amelioration of the multi-year severe drought in California that occurred in very early 2017. Again, look at this blue ellipse. This amelioration of a very severe drought occurred over about a 60 day period was only forecast at a lead of up to about two weeks. And I should note that this occurred despite La Nina conditions, which as we've previously discussed, generally favors below normal precipitation for most of California. I should also note that this year's monsoon, this year's Southwest summer monsoon, which Richard mentioned has been at normal or above normal, was similarly only predicted accurately at about a two week lead. So longer term forecasts from the state of the art models indicated mostly below normal precipitation for the southwest monsoon. We know that has turned out, fortunately, to not be the case. Again, underscoring this 
fact that the state-of-the-art models are not able to capture transitions from very wet conditions to very dry or vice versa beyond about a two-week lead. Next slide. So the final topic I want to cover is an exciting collaboration between NIDIS and CPC that will lead to an objective probabilistic drought outlook. Key features of this probabilistic drought outlook will include co-development with stakeholders to ensure that the outlook will be both useful and usable for them. It's also going to have a very long, consistent set of historical predictions that will allow establishment of skill and confidence levels that will help to inform stakeholder decisions, i.e. does it meet their risk tolerance for skill uh, and confidence. But I also want to emphasize that, as I mentioned earlier, in order to get maximum value from tools such as this, we need to continue to improve the skill of our subseasonal to seasonal precipitation forecasts. Next slide. So um, in closing, I want to emphasize again that given the strong likelihood of La Nina conditions and a warm temperature trend this fall, uh, the drought in the Southwest is likely to persist, expand, and intensify. Uh, and that will continue, those conditions will continue into winter. Transition to a wetter pattern would only be forecastable accurately at approximately two week lead and there's no indication at this time that that is going to happen. This limited predictability for precipitation on this time scale is truly a grand challenge that the science community, I hope, embraces so that we can try to do a better job in informing stakeholders uh, for their water resources needs. And, and in order to do that, we will require sufficient sustained investment targeting some extremely challenging science issues. Finally, CPC and NIDAS are collaborating to produce probabilistic drought outlooks that will be co-developed with stakeholders. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, I appreciate the, the, the remarks and the presentation. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on uh, to next here from Jim Wallman about fire conditions. Jim? All right. Uh, thank you, Viva. Well, we'll go ahead and just talk about uh, the fall fire outlook, but at first I'm going to uh, discuss the current situation across uh, the West with our fire season. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, right now, we are just dropped yesterday to preparedness level four uh, nationally, which is on a scale of one to five. Uh, Northern California area is still at a preparedness level five. The preparedness level is based on current fire activity, uh, forecast weather, and also the amount of resources available. Generally, when we were at a preparedness level five, we are tapped out of resources nationally and have to look into uh, the military or international agreements to uh, supplement our resources in the states. Uh, this year, we spent our longest period at preparedness level five since 1990 when records began being kept here at the National Interagency Fire Center from July 14th to September 20th. We are currently at 90 days at preparedness level four or higher, which is also the longest ever since 1990. Currently, there are 21 type one and two incident management teams deployed across the Western United States. Uh, next slide, please. While we look at the background with the drought, we it's kind of at the transition between weather and climate where short-term weather events can impact the fire season, especially when well-timed. One example is the recent precipitation event last weekend over much of the Northwest, Northern California into, into Idaho and Montana. While activity was still ongoing across the Northwest and Northern California, three to five inches of rain on some of the fires in west on Western Oregon, uh, west of the Cascades and up to an inch uh, or two inches of rain in Northwest California has significantly slowed activity there. However, in the Sierra, uh, especially on the east side where portions of the Dixie Fire and Caldor Fire are burning, they did not receive as much precipitation. Uh, one other uh, area that is of note here is, the, is across central Idaho into southwest Montana, which uh, did not receive as much rainfall with this event. And if we go to the next slide, it can show the energy release component. Uh, so 
the energy release component there, and this is on a percentile based on uh, historical values. Uh, anything generally below 58% is, is shown in the green, and uh, anything, excuse me, sorry, anything below 78% in, in the lighter green. And so these values here are, are showing that it still remains dry, quite dry across central Idaho and southwest Montana, where we still have a couple of large fires burning, as well as portions of Southern California, especially the Southern Sierra into central Nevada, where it remains uh, uh, very dry. However, if you were to look down into the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, uh, as a result of the robust monsoon this year, that uh, the energy release components or the amount of uh, fuel available to burn actively uh, is, is closer to background values, if not below normal for the time of year. Uh, next slide. So going through and looking at our significant fire potential outlooks, these are issued monthly uh, forecasting above or below normal significant fire potential for the next four months. So what we have just done, we completed it last month, is looking for the rest of the year from September through December. We are about to do our discussions uh, here in a couple of days for the next outlook, which will be from October through January. It combines the current situation with forecast weather and climate. So we use the Climate Prediction Center outlooks. Uh, They're also invited on our calls and we have discussion. And we also go into a, a more detailed discussion of the total fire environment. These are really a great planning resource for the fire committee where severity quests and uh, resource allocation extensions of teams or resources are, are used. And these are a really good planning tool. So for the next four months, we go to the next slide. Uh, at least for the rest of September. This has changed somewhat uh, based on the recent precipitation, but at the beginning of the month, we were looking at above normal significant fire potential for much of the West, um, and also in portions of the lee sides of Hawaii where it has been abnormally dry. And also with the drought in Northern Minnesota, we've had large fires there this summer. One of those fires, uh, the Greenwood fire burned over 26,000 acres last month. So that was what we were looking at, although the conditions now for especially the Northwest and Washington, Oregon, with the recent precipitation event, are probably going back to normal as we head into the next month. And if we go to the next slide, we are looking at part of this is function of the time of year, looking at below, you know, going back to near normal significant fire potential for the Northwest and uh, Northern Rockies as they generally come out of fire season but continue to be above normal for Northern California and then portions of Wyoming into Northwest Colorado, where it is still dry. Uh, also the, the lee side slopes of Hawaii. Uh, there also is potential for dryness along the East Coast uh, as we head into fall, although uh, the timing of any uh, longer dry periods and whether they coincide with fall leaf drop will really dictate the fire potential. Uh, if we go to the next slide for November, uh, really our, our above normal uh, potential for areas is really going to be confined to portions of the southeast and mid-Atlantic and northern California, especially northern California due to the long-term drought and until the uh, first significant precipitation events uh, arrive for the, for the winter season. So that's what we're looking at. And again, like the southeast will be mitigated potentially, you know, depending on when the dry event, the drier periods occur uh, and whether they coincide with the fall leaf drop. And then uh, next slide, for December, uh, we are just forecasting a near normal fire potential at this time of year. Generally, most of the, the country at this time is generally out of fire season, so we're not uh, looking for anything above normal potential but there are a couple areas that we will continue to monitor, especially Southern California into December with the La Nina. And if it continues to remain dry, any uh, significant Santa Ana events could elevate the potential there. Also, any cross moving through the Southwest into the Southern Plains, uh, we, we could have above brief periods of above normal potential with strong winds uh, coinciding with any dry periods there. Um, so last slide. If you go to the next slide, just to summarize, really we've had a really significant activity observed for a long duration this summer, uh, longer than we've ever observed in the last 30 years. 
The recent rainfall event has significantly slowed the season for the northwest quarter of the United States, uh, with higher than normal potential continuing for portions of the west, mainly in the northern California, Wyoming, and northwest Colorado into November. There is also potential for the higher normal than normal potential in the southeast, but again, depending on any dryness coinciding with the fall leaf drop. And then as we head into winter, we, we also kind of monitor, although it's more of the focus of the National Weather Service at the local offices, potential for any debris flows on the west coast with any landfalling atmospheric rivers during the wet season. And thank you. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, appreciate the the um, the presentation. So um, this is uh, we actually are a little bit ahead of schedule, um, which is great um, because it allows us to have a little bit more time with the panelists. So I'll invite the panelists, um, Richard Heim, actually to join us on uh, turn your camera on, and we can uh, we can start the Q and A session. I wanted to remind folks if you have a question that you'd like to ask, go ahead and type it into the chat box. Um, I do have a couple of questions that have come in. I also wanted to give Richard a chance because I had to, um, I had to <laughs> hurry you along because I was thinking that the, we were going to be at time. But we have a few extra minutes. So I'm offering you the opportunity if you wanted to elaborate on anything in your presentation that you think uh, if you'd had a few minutes more, you could have covered a little bit more. Yeah, I noticed on the slide that had the temperature time series and the precipitation time series west-wide, I skipped over the two left-hand side slides showing the 12-month precipitation and 12-month temperature over the last 126, 127 years. Um, the last 20 years precipitation 12-month values have been drier than the long-term average than wet for the west wide. And the temperature time series for the last 40 years has been showing a market increasing trend in heat. And that I, I wanted to mention um, will be a, a problem for evapotranspiration, exacerbating drought when it happens. And it just seems to be getting worse and worse just that uh, June to August, summer 2021 point on that summer temperature graph. It's just, it, it's it's a full degree warmer than the previous record summer temperature west-wide. So it's, um, it, it it's kind of just blows me away when I look at those time series that we have some issues in the west when it comes to drought. And it the, the data just, show that it, it isn't going to get any better. I also wanted to mention the VHI, Vegetation Health Index, time series that I showed. There was a two time series for each state, one for all of the land and the other for the agricultural parts of the land in each state. Those time series for the last 40 years from the Noah Nesta Star people show that the last 20 years have been predominantly drought prone in these six states. And the 1980s and 90s had some droughts. The 19, late 80s, early 90s drought in California, and I think it was Arizona, uh, shows up, they show up very well in those graphs as well. And the VHI is, of course, a satellite born indicator that measures uh, vegetative health. So it's what we've got on, on these data these time series are fair, are very consistent across platforms, across types of data. Um, it's just uh, amazing. Um, thanks for the elaboration. Um, I think it definitely um, it definitely corresponds with this dialogue that we're going to be having for the next four um, four days. Um, let me uh, let me go ahead and. and uh, tackle a few of these questions here. Um, we had one question for Dave DeWitt. Um, the question is, can you elaborate on the grand challenge in predicting subseasonal to seasonal precipitation? What are some of the biggest barriers to incremental improvement in the predictive skill in this area? Sure, I'm happy to address that, Viva. So um, the primary prediction tool that we use are these um, 
very complicated ocean atmosphere coupled models, which do a lot of things very, very well. One of the things they don't do particularly well at is tropical precipitation. And uh, the tropics, it turns out, uh, drive a large part of um, mid-latitude variability, essentially where we live. And so um, you can look back 20 or 30 years, um, and there are errors that existed when we first started to develop this technology that are still present at about the same magnitude at, as they were at that time. And perhaps more importantly, the size of the error is the same as the size of the signal, if not bigger. And so better understanding the interaction between the boundary layer in both the atmosphere and the ocean and their interaction and deep convection is a really thorny problem that we have not spent a lot of time, effort, and energy addressing, kind of punting that forward as a difficult problem. I think a lot of people believe if we can make progress on that, that would be beneficial for many things. Um, and, and certainly with respect to um, uh, precipitation forecasting over the Southwest US. Another key area is land atmosphere interaction. Um, you know, these models require a lot of computing to accurately capture representations of land um, and and how that interacts you know with the soil moisture and and uh, the vegetation cover with the atmosphere and that's another area where we really and again the models do a lot of things great in these areas um, if we had improved investment we could uh, hopefully improve the physical representation and that would improve in turn downstream our precipitation forecasts on, on sub-seasonal and seasonal timescales. So thanks for the opportunity. Sure, and and thank you, Dave. Um, let me ask, I guess, somewhat of a, a follow-up question or it's somewhat related. This is a question from one of the media outlets on the line. What science is needed um, to, I'm sorry, I just lost my time. What science is needed to improve our ability to predict the transitions in drought conditions. So I yeah. think that question could be answered by you as well as potentially Richard as well. So yes, Dave, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so so from my perspective, again, that that really uh, is largely going to be tied to our ability to predict uh, this tropical variability that will influence the jet stream and its contraction and expansion. Uh, as well as the land atmosphere interaction. Uh, and, um, you know, so it's different. It's different seasonally, right? So Western precipitation over California in the winter, that's that's snow, that's associated with um, contraction and expansion of the jet. Northern plains, Southern plains, Southwest um, precipitation in the summer, that's really related to land atmosphere interaction. There certainly is a, a forcing component associated with the tropics but you also need to get that land atmosphere interaction correct. So it depends on, on the season and it depends upon the region. Richard, did you wanna add any insight? Yeah, I think Dave covered a lot of the good, the aspects um, that forecasters look at with the tropics being an important driver, the uh, jet stream, the mid-latitude circulation being an important factor. One thing that I would like to, that I've been thinking about for oh, decades since I read a paper by Kalnicky back in college in the 1970s is what effect does changing the atmospheric composition, the greenhouse warming, uh, and changing the heat balance uh, hemispherically, the latitudinal north pole cold, equator warm temperature gradient, what effect does that have on the jet stream um, it's positioning the amplitude of the ridges troughs, the mean latitudinal location of the jet stream seasonally. Um, that is, an, I think, is an important factor in precipitation, in heat waves beneath ridges, and, and, and so on. But there's also another thing that I remember reading, gosh, decades ago, I think a paper by Lorenz concerning transitive, intransitive, and almost intransitive states of the circulation where the jet stream can be set up in certain wave patterns and very quickly in atmospheric time scales switch from one pattern to another. Um, those aspects, I think, are things I'd like to see explored more in forecasting and atmospheric research. 
the, the jet stream, the nature of it, how is it going to be changing? Right. Thank you, Richard. Um, I didn't want to leave James or Jim out. We do have a question for you. Um, it's not 100% Southwest related, but let me go ahead and ask it. Hmm. With the Southeast having a wet summer with above average precip, would the risk for wildfire be mitigated somewhat due to the prediction with elevated soil moisture levels heading into the fall season? Um, it, it can be an impact. However, uh, the research that was done at our Southern Area Coordination Center in Georgia, uh, what they found is that dry, drier periods that coincide with your uh, the, the leaves falling off the trees and your fine fuels that end up you know going on the ground that they are the drivers of, of large fires in that area so while your herbaceous fuels and your live fuels such as grasses uh, your shrubs will remain green and not contribute to fire the larger fires in that area are, are largely determined by by your fall uh, leaf drop coinciding with dryness. Right, thank you. Um, and I think we had one more question that we have time um, to cover. Um, two of the presenters, I believe it was Dave and Richard, uh, mentioned La Nina as a climate driver. Are there other drivers that we can look at for drought development or relief in the West? Dave, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. So if, if you look at the, the major modes of variability on, on a seasonal time scale, El Nino, La Nina is the strongest by far, right? And and so that's why we tend to speak about that. Now, it's not a perfect predictor, obviously. I mean, I gave the case of California where despite La Nina conditions, very strong flooding, in fact, record flooding. Um, if you go to the shorter time scale, there's another phenomenon called the Madden-Julian oscillation. Yeah which is extremely important. Um, and again, it's it's this fact that variability in the tropics forces the mid-latitudes in several different mechanisms. Um, there are also other wave mechanisms um, near the tropics that, that have similar impacts uh, on the mid-latitudes. Um, so yeah, I think that's how I would answer. Yeah, I, I think I would add that there are other indicators, other modes, that have um, nice acronyms like PNA, AO, NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation, Arctic Oscillation, North Pacific Oscillation, uh, uh, things. And, and those are more mid-latitude driven, but their predictability is weaker. Their uh, time scale is not as long as, as the uh, ENSO is. And um, I do want to mention that uh, Jerry, Dr. Namias, over from the 1950s into the 70s and 80s, focused a lot on mid-latitude drivers, but this was before the big El Nino of 1983, focused attention on the tropics and illuminated how important the tropics were. So that there are uh, other things besides the mm -hmm. tropics that drive the circulation. Um, it's, it's really hard to determine and predict the mid-latitude jet circulation, the jet stream as a predictor because it both is influenced by uh, oceanic temperature, uh, sea surface temperature anomalies, as well as affects them. There's a two-way interaction there. But whereas the, the ENSO, the La Nina, El Nino are much more solid, the science is much firmer, they are much better predicted as well as the MJO. So, um, I think I just leave it at that. Okay, great. Well, thank you again to our panelists. Um, we appreciate you spending some time with us this morning. Appreciate the foundation that you are starting to lay with us for the rest of this uh, forum. So we are actually going to go ahead and start our next panel a few minutes early. We have all of our panelists ready. So um, again, thank you very much, Jim, Richard, and Dave. All right, so um, let's move on to the next panel. The goal of the next panel is to put this drought, both the last year and a half and the last two decades, into the context of the broader climate. Um, we will first hear from Andy Hoyle and Isla Simpson, 
Andy is a research meteorologist at the NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory and co-leads the NOAA Drought Task Force. Isla Simpson is a research scientist in the Climate and Global Dynamics Laboratory at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR. Following Isla, we will learn about aridification from Erica Fleischman. Erica is the director of the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute and is a professor at Oregon State University. So with those introductions, I turn it over to you, Andy. Yeah, thank you, Isla. And um, thank you to the prior speakers. That was a really nice discussion. So as part of setting the stage, the NOAA Drop Task Force is here to, today to present on conditions that led to the 2020 to 2021 drought and what the future may hold for drought in the Southwest United States. Uh, our presentation today is based on a more comprehensive report on the ongoing drought and the report may be found on drought.gov and on NOAA Climate Program Office websites. Uh, the NOAA Drought Task Force is led by myself, Andy Hoyle, Isla Simpson, who will also present today, and Justin Mankin, who led a report on the drought, and also Rong Fu. Our contact information can be found on the slide. The NOAA Drought Task Force is made up of approximately 50 scientists representing federal, academic, and private institutions that are funded to perform various aspects of drought research by NIDAS and the NOAA Climate Program Office's Modeling Analysis Predictions and Projection Program. Members of the Drought Task Force collaborate on joint projects, one of which you'll learn about today on the ongoing Southwest U.S. drought. We're thankful for our ongoing collaboration and the support of NIDAS. Moving on to the next slide, we illustrate the severity of the ongoing Southwest U.S. drought from time series of naturalized flows of the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry in Arizona. The time series is for January to December, or calendar year in million acre feet. The colors indicate the percentile rank of calendar year flows, where browner colors indicate increasingly lower flows. The fourth lowest flow in the historical record since 1906 was observed in 2021, and this was on the heels of low flow in 2020. For the last 20 years, these ferry naturalized flows were also low in the historical record, with four years in the low 10 percentile of the historical distribution. Moving on to the next slide, we show the four questions that were considered in a report on the 2020 to 2021 Southwest U.S. drought. How bad is it? How did it evolve? When will it end? And what does the future hold? So for bre brevity, we will only discuss aspects related to how bad is it and what does the future hold. I'll present on how bad is it and Isla will present on what our future holds. So moving on to the next slide, we begin our assessment of conditions that led to the severity of the drought by showing precipitation for January to August of the following year. On the left is precipitation percentiles for that 20 month period over the contiguous US for January 2020 to August 2021. The Southwest US states, California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado are highlighted. On the right is time series of 20 month precipitation over the Southwest United States with the colors indicating the percentile rank of precipitation. Again, like the following time, the previous time series, browner colors mean lower precipitation. Profound and widespread dryness was observed across the Southwest United States, with many areas ex experiencing their lowest such 20 month stretch. And those areas that did not receive their lowest precipitation were among the lowest on record. The profound dryness was caused by consecutive failed rainy seasons, notably winters in 2020 and 2021, and the failed monsoon in 2020, which led to record low, by far record low precipitation over the four corner states during June to September of 2020. For the regional average on the right, January 2020 to August 2021 experienced by far the lowest precipitation on record. No other 20 month stretch since 1895 rivaled 2020 and 2021. You can see there that there are about six years that were among the lowest and they rivaled one another, but they paled in comparison to 2020. The exceptional dryness in the last 20 months punctuates two decades of low precipitation. However, it's still important to note that decades of low precipitation have been observed over the Southwest United States. Examples include the 1920s and 1970s, though this 20 year stretch is a little bit longer than the ones that we had seen prior. Moving on to the next slide, 
We illustrate here the warmth during the 20 month period spanning January 2020 to August 2021. The left panel shows temperature percentile ranks, which indicates widespread warmth across the Southwest United States that fell into the upper five percentile of the historical record since 1895. The right panel shows a time series of regional average temperature for 20 month periods beginning in January. And again, the color scale is similar to what we showed in prior time series, where bluer colors indicate cooler temperatures relative to a historical record and warmer colors, warmer temperatures relative to the historical record. January 2020 to August 2021 was the third warmest stretch in our instrumental record. This 20 month period caps off what was by far the warmest decade we have experienced in the Southwest United States. Note that the warmth in the last decade continued the warming trend in the Southwest United States that began in the early 1980s. So we'll now tackle the question of what the future holds for the Southwest US and I'll turn it over to my colleague Isla. Thanks. So yeah, I'll, I'll try and address the question of what role has greenhouse gas driven climate change played and what we've seen, first of all, in the shorter term in 2020 in particular, and then also in the last couple of decades of aridification that we've seen. And then what should we be expecting moving forward for the coming decades? Uh, so if you go to the next slide. So the tool I'll use here will be Earth system models. So these are global, fully coupled numerical models of the Earth system. So they're simulating the historical climate and then projecting future climate change. And they're given forces such as greenhouse gas emissions and aerosols and other natural and anthropogenic forcings. And we'll use 33 different models that are developed from modeling centers from all around the world. And these are the simulations that contributed to the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. So next slide. So we'll focus on area averages over the six states in the US Southwest, and I'll show two quantities, precipitation, which doesn't really need more explanation, and then vapor pressure deficit, which might be less familiar. Uh, so next slide. So just to explain a bit more what VPD means is basically the atmosphere's thirst for water. So it's the difference between how much water vapor the atmosphere is capable of holding and how much it has. And, and how much water vapor the atmosphere is capable of holding, that depends on temperature. So this is where you might expect that greenhouse gas driven warming might play an important role in what we're seeing. And so basically, if you have a higher vapor pressure deficit than if you have moisture available, you're going to see more evaporation, more drying out of the land surface and evaporation from reservoirs and so on. So next slide. So it's important to just keep in mind that precipitation and VPD are kind of interconnected. If you have a year with higher precipitation, you'll likely have a lower VPD. And that's because a year with higher precipitation, the atmosphere will have more water vapor and it will likely also be cooler. But then also both of these quantities can be affected just by natural internal variability in the system and they can also be influenced by anthropogenic climate change and so trying to pull out the climate change part of this is what we're going to do here so if you go to the next slide so i'm going to walk you through this figure which is showing precipitation on the horizontal and then vapor pressure deficit in the vertical and the dots here that you see are uh, the observed anomalies um, for, the for the 1950 to 2000 period. And these are anomalies from the average of that period. And the dots, they're color coded based on the year. So we're going from the 1950s in the dark blue to the, the 90s in the lighter blue. And so you see here this relationship between VPD and precipitation. And if you go to the next slide, um, what you see here in the contours, this is what we get from our Earth system model. So this is the joint probability distribution of precipitation of VPD as simulated by the models. So basically, the contours are showing how likely is it that you'll have a year which has this kind of joint value of precipitation and VPD, with the darker colors being more likely. And so you see that our observed years, they sit pretty nicely within this model distribution. And so that gives us some confidence in the behavior of the models. But this is just up to the year 2000 at this point. So if we go to the next slide, the dots here, now we're going into those yellow and orange colors, and this is showing the observed values for the last two decades. 
And so what you see is there, there hasn't, there's not really a clear trend in precipitation, but there's a very clear trend in vapor pressure deficit. These dots are moving up towards a higher VPD. And then you see 2020 there off on its own, it's pretty extreme in terms of having both low precipitation and higher vapor pressure deficit. And so these dots in the last couple of decades have really moved outside of the distribution that we get from the models in the pre-2000 climate. So if we go to the next slide, we can ask the question of the models, if we were in the pre-2000 climate, so from 1950 to 2000, what would be the chances that we'd have a year like 2020 in both precipitation and then in, in vapor pressure deficit? And so the models suggest that having a year like 2020 with as low precipitation as what we've seen, there's about a 2% chance of that happening. So a one in 50 year kind of event, which is somewhat consistent with our observational record. But when you look at VPD, um, none of the years of the almost 2000 years of simulation that are going into that blue cloud there uh, exhibits VPD as high we got, as what we got in 2020. It was basically impossible in the pre-2000 climate, according to the models. But of course, since the year 2000, we've had anthropogenic warming. And so if we go to the next slide, what you see in this orange cloud here is now the model's probability distribution centered on 2020. So this is for the years 2010 to 2030. And you can see that the model distribution has shifted up towards higher vapor pressure deficits, which is very aligned with what we've seen in the observations. And now if we ask that same question, what's the chance of having a year like 2020? For precipitation, it hasn't really changed. There's not been an increase in the probability of having a year as low as 2020 for precipitation. But for VPD, it has changed. It's gone from being basically impossible in the pre-2000 climate, according to the models, to now being possible. It's still extreme. There's still only a 0.4% chance that you'd have a year like 2020 but it has now become possible. And that's because we really shifted towards higher vapor pressure deficits because of anthropogenic warming. And so if you go to the next slide, what we're showing here now in this kind of purple blob is the model's projections for the coming decades for, for the 2030 to 2050 period. And so again, we don't really see a clear systematic change in precipitation. Um, the, the likelihood of having a year like 2020 is not systematically increasing or decreasing over time. But for VPD, it's a very different story. And there's a, a clear systematic increase in vapor pressure deficit simulated by the models. And they suggest that a year like what we've had in 2020, by the time we're at kind of 2030 to 2050, it will be a one in 10 year kind of event. Um, so, the model suggests anthropogenic climate change is not really changing the likelihood of having a precipitation event like 2020, but it is definitely changing the likelihood of having vapor pressure deficit like what we saw in 2020. So next slide. So I just want to finish up by addressing kind of longer time scales because we've also had this longer term aridification. And so here I'm just showing the um, same figure, but for decadal means, and these are rolling decadal means um, over the, the period. And so this is our 1950 to 2000 period for decadal averages. And if we go to the next slide, this is now showing how the real world has evolved up to the last decade and how our models think things should be evolving under anthropogenic climate change. And so if we ask the same questions of what, what's the chances of having a decade like the ones that we've just seen based on our models, for precipitation, again, there's no clear systematic change in the likelihood of having a decade with as low precipitation as what we've seen in the last decade. But for vapor pressure deficit, there's definitely a clear systematic change. And our model suggests that a decade like the one we've just seen basically just wouldn't have happened in a pre-2000 climate for VPD. There's now about a 7% chance of having a decade like the one we've just seen and moving forward by 2030 to 2050, the models suggest that a decade like the one we've just seen for vapor pressure deficit would be kind of a normal decade. So if you go to the next slide, um, just finish up with the, the key takeaways here. So kind of for the near term drought that we've just experienced as Andy uh, went through 2020 to 21 was extreme. The, the precipitation deficits were the lowest on record. Uh, but our models indicate that climate change did not really make these precipitation deficits more likely. 
The vapor pressure deficits were the highest on record and climate change almost certainly contributed to this. Um, the warming that occurred since the late 20th century has really made it possible to have VPD this high. But even if you account for climate change, 2020 was still a very extreme year. Looking to the future, we have no indications that climate change will drive annual mean precipitation declines over the Southwest as a whole, but I do want to point out that there's quite a lot of complexity if you start to dig deeper and wonder about seasonal variations or more uh, local spatial variations within the region. And we should be prepared for continued increases in vapor pressure deficit due to warming. And by 2030 to 2050, we should expect about one in 10 years to have VPD as high as 2020. And that a normal decade will look like 2011 to 2020 in vapor pressure deficit. So that's pretty much all I have. I just, uh, if you go to the next slide, I do just want to point out that there are many open questions and other things uh, that we, we still need to understand about this drought and about longer term aridification and our future projected changes, but that's basically kind of uh, what we present is, is our understanding at this point. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Isla and Andy. Um, whoops, turn my camera back on. Um, all right, well, again, I will remind attendees that if you have questions, please start putting them into the questions box. We already have a couple I see, um, and we will have a Q&A after um, Erica's presentation. Looks like we will have a lot of good information to um, continue to dialogue with these panelists. So next up um, is Erica. Erica? I think you're you're muted. I, I cannot hear you. I see you, but I can't hear you. How's that? There you go. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, well, our presentations are going to dovetail um, really nicely. You you may even think it was was uh, was done by design. Um, so please, um, thank you very much. It's it's a pleasure to be here talking with all of you. Uh, next slide, please. I want to recognize uh, the people that have been working on um, what I'm going to be sharing with you today. It's a terrific group of people, and uh, we've been doing this work under the auspices of the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. Next slide, please. So as, um, as has just been reviewed, um, mean temperature in the Southwest has been increasing in recent decades and is projected to continue increasing quite a bit. Um, regardless of realistic emission scenarios. Next, please. So coincident with that, it's not just means, um, it's extremes that are increasing. And next slide, please. Um, temperatures are increasing throughout the year and summer, um, in, in a relative sense, summer is increasing more than, um, more than some other seasons, depends exactly where you are, but, um, but we're looking at increases in means and we're looking at increases in extremes. Next slide, please. So a region that is known for, um, for being hot and dry is becoming hotter and drier. And um, one of those manifestations, next slide please, is, um, is drought. So there are a lot of different ways of defining drought. Um, the most basic way to define drought is simply um, insufficient water to meet needs. And that's a definition um, that many of you may have known Kelly Redmond that he just said, you know, it's just, it's simply not having enough water. Um, but there are a lot of different ways to quantify not having enough water. Um, and I want to briefly mention two metrics to keep in mind. So uh, next slide, please. So if you think about basic biology, um, one way to, to look at water is sort of atmospheric thirst. Um, and think about evaporation, evapotranspiration. So think about all of the ways in which um, water in which water is converted to um, to water vapor or ice is converted to water vapor. So um, so plants respiring, evaporation, um, direct direct sublimation of snow and ice. And this is there are ways of kind of standardizing measurements or estimates for models, but it, this can be pretty tricky to measure. All um, all measures of drought, really a lot of biological variables can be pretty difficult to measure. So, um, so one way to, to look at dryness is atmospheric. And next slide, please. Another way to look at it is, um, is soil moisture. And um, soil moisture is, turns out to be pretty tricky. There are, um, soil moisture often is measured over large areas through remote sensing. 
um, and it turns out there can be a lot of challenges in that. Um, soil moisture also can be measured at different depths. Um, but so for the purposes of this, just keep in mind, you can have atmospheric water and you can have soil water. And both of these are used um, often to try to estimate how, how dry things are and how dry things may be in the future. Next slide, please. Um, so as was just mentioned, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is looking at um, many things that are changing as a result of greenhouse gas emissions. And one of those um, is soil moisture. And so um, the IPCC's most recent report refers to agricultural drought and ecological drought. We'll get into that a little bit in a second. Um, but how they are measuring those types of drought amounts to um, soil moisture deficit. And what this is illustrating, this is a representation of the world as hexagons. Um, focus on WNA over there in the, um, in the upper left. So that's Western North America. And there is, um, there has been a, there's high confidence or high confidence that, um, that soil moisture deficit is increasing in Western North America and medium confidence that much of that is attributable to um, anthropogenic climate change. Um, so this is this is fairly well established. Next slide, please. And um, also, as was just discussed, um, it is likely that um, that these deficits that we've been having, if you want to think of it just in terms of that severe droughts are going to um, increase in frequency and increase in magnitude throughout the Southwest and really the entire Western United States um, in the coming decades. Next slide, please. So lots and lots of different ways of, um, of thinking about drought. And some of them um, are, in a sense, fairly easy to measure. I mean, they are, or they're, um, they're more, more objectively measured. So meteorological drought is pretty straightforward to measure. Hydrological drought is pretty, um, somewhat, somewhat straightforward to measure. But there are a lot of types of drought that are kind of open to interpretation in terms of what does drought mean. Um, next slide, please. We really see this as we get into um, into ecological. So ecological drought, for example, has been thought of as sort of the point at which there are thresholds in um, ecosystem resilience or something like that. And they are great concepts, but they can be um, they can be pretty difficult to quantify to say what does this mean to a particular species of plant, whether it's um, cultivated or whether it's wild. What does this mean to a particular animal, especially when animals can move? What does this mean to a process? So lots and lots of different ways of looking at drought, lots of ways to measure it, um, lots of ways to interpret what it means to, to humans and to natural systems. So next slide, please. Okay, so, um, so again, summing up um, a lot of effects of, of aridity, I'm gonna be talking about aridity for a bit, the inverse of water availability, um, and lots and lots of mechanisms. Um, so how do we kind of get into that? Uh, next slide, please. So thinking about you know, what, what contributes to aridity, um, we tend to think about precipitation. I mean, I think for many of us, we think that if, there, if there's drought, it means that it hasn't been raining and snowing much. Um, and that in part is true, but um, next slide, please. Although, um, although this has been a very dry period um, over much of the Southwest, aside from the, the monsoon this past summer, it's been a really dry period for quite a while across, across the West and the Southwest. Um, next slide, please. Precipitation over the um, over the water year in the Southwest um, has actually been fairly stable and is projected to um, to increase. Uh, precipitation across the region is projected to either stay fairly stable or even increase a little bit in the coming decades, um, even as even given the various scenarios of anthropogenic climate change. Um, next slide, please. And that um, that is true during during all seasons um, across across the region as a whole. Um, and it's it's somewhat variable. If you get up into into the northwest, um, summers are projected to become drier and winters wetter. But if you look at these regions as a whole, there's some averaging. So basically, precipitation is projected to be stable. Um, so what else is going on? Next slide, please. Other contributors to um, to aridity besides precipitation. Next slide. Um, we're all pretty familiar with the fact that um, for a given amount of water, if the temperature is higher, um, that is likely, that water is likely to become less available more rapidly. So um, next slide. 
So basically, for a given amount of water, as it becomes hotter, um, water use by plants, one, one form of water use is likely to, um, plants are likely to need more water um, as it becomes hotter. And so this means that, that water, water is less available, even though the amount of water that um, falls from the sky may not change that much. So next slide. Um, this becomes pretty interesting. So again, you know, transpiration is increasing. Um, something that has not been addressed that much, it's, it's pretty difficult at this point, but it's being observed in small areas um, and is, is a conceptual possibility is that in some cases, um, some plants may become um, more efficient uh, users of, as carbon dioxide increases, they may be able to use water more efficiently. So there may be some offset um, in drought stress, in, but that's not likely to be everywhere and it's not likely to be all the time, but it's kind of an interesting um, conceptual twist in all of this and gets to the notion that, um, that plants and animals are, are pretty adaptable if given, if given half a chance. So next slide, please. Um, some of the other contributors, so we have, we have water being one contributor, precipitation, we have temperature being a contributor, also um, wind speed, solar radiation, and humidity. All of these contribute to, um, to overall aridity or basically to water limitation. And which of these contributors is dominant in a particular place and time um, actually matters quite a bit to agricultural systems and to ecological systems. Next slide, please. So for example, um, butterflies are quite sensitive to overall water limitation um, in part because they depend on plants for food as caterpillars and for, um, for food as adults, at least for the species that take nectar from flowers. But they're also really sensitive to solar radiation because they're cold blooded and they need to, um, to warm up and able to, in order to be able to fly and to find mates and to feed. So for that animal, it's not just overall water limitation, it's also the driver, it's the driver of solar radiation. And there are other, um, other cultivated or wild species that are more or less sensitive to those different drivers of aridity. So in part, what is driving aridity um, in a particular place and time really matters in addition to the overall metric of aridity itself. Next slide, please. Um, this this is <laughs> this is hard stuff to figure out, and so um, it's fantastic that computing capacity is increasing, and that a lot of um, a lot of statistical methods are evolving and in many ways improving over time. Um, but it's really hard to tease all of this apart, both um, both conceptually and um, and numerically. So next slide, please. So what, what this group of us that I mentioned at the start is trying to do, this is very much work in progress, is we're trying to look at um, past and future ecologically available water. And remember those metrics. So we're looking at it in terms of atmospheric values, various measures of, of, um, of evaporation, atmospheric uh, vapor pressure deficit, things like that. We're also looking at it in terms of soil measures. And we're trying to decompose those estimates of water availability into all of those drivers that I mentioned. So into wind, temperature, solar radiation, and humidity. And looking at that um, in how it varies in seasons and in regions, first in the past to try to get a good explanatory model, and then hopefully in the future projecting how this may change in the future and what this means for, um, for different organisms. So next slide, please. Next, please. Great. Um, thank you. So uh, the way that we are looking at this, um, for those of you that, that are thinking about all of the data sets um, for, for the past observations, um, we're looking at the ERI-5 reanalysis. It's taken a lot of time to zoom in on um, or to zero in on what the, um, what the best sources of data for these analyses are likely to be. Um, projections, if, uh, if downscaled projections from CMIP-6 are available by the time we get into this in earnest, we'll use CMIP-6. Otherwise, we'll be using CMIP-5. Um, across the West, moderate uh, spatial resolution, we probably can go to finer resolution locally. Um, there are some emerging downscales that are um, as small as two to six kilometers, but probably not across the entire region. And we are fairly confident that we can get a temporal extent that starts um, in 1980 and goes up to 2100. Um, we may be able to go back to 1950, but we're not, um, we're not entirely sure about that just yet. Um, so just some examples of what this looks like when you decompose. Next slide, please. 
So this is an example um, that Mike Hobbins um, has, has worked up. Um, this is not the West Coast, but it's a good example nevertheless. So basically think of this, um, I'm gonna oversimplify a little bit. This is overall water limitation um, over a two month period um, last summer. Next slide, please. If you decompose that overall measure of aridity into various drivers, so what you can see here, temperature, humidity, radiation, and wind speed, just look at the differences in the colors. So, um, so there was not, um, certain things were, were driving this more than others. And temperature in this case was a greater driver than a change in humidity or in, um, in radiation or wind. So different, um, different of those contributors have different effects, but keep in mind again, in different time periods and in different places. So next slide. Another example um, from a different from a different place, um, same thing here, but in this case, temperature in the northern Great Plains, um, going with the same. Sorry about not having labels on there. Um, not quite, not quite the same here. So in this case, wind, which is in the lower right, um, was a major contributor um, in addition to temperature and um, and humidity. Again, not as much of a contributor, but different things going on in different time periods and in different places. Next, please. So what we are um, what we are planning to do here is is also to be able to make these um, data inputs and data outputs um, easy to visualize and to download. Uh, most likely working through the Climate Toolbox, which is led by John Abatzaglou. Um, so we hope to be able to have data layers that users can pretty easily download or download the data behind them. Um, the data are available, but they can be um, they can be a pain to to extract without without a lot of computing power. And also to um, to examine how these how these measures of aridity and how the different contributions of different drivers um, in space and time affect different types of plants and animals. So next slide, please. Pardon the interruption, Erica. You have three minutes left. Yep, I'm. This is about it. Uh, so so again, plants and animals are adaptable. Um, their responses to climate can change over time, can evolve. Um, however, we we think that those case studies will be. Um, will be useful in terms of illustrating to users what they might be able to do with these um, input and output data layers. And last slide, please. Thank you again. Um, that's all I have and looking forward to talking with you further. Great, thank you so much, Erica. Um, all right, at this time, I'm gonna invite um, Andy and Isla to turn your cameras back on and unmute yourselves for a Q&A session. We do have some questions um, that came in. I would just like to, again, invite folks to, um, if you have a question, to type it into the questions box and um, we can go ahead and get that question out to the panelists. Um, we are gonna be ending the Q&A session at, at uh, 1240 Eastern Daylight Time. So just to do a time check with everybody. So let's go ahead and get to some of the questions here. Um, I'm gonna start with a question from Tony Willardson, who is with the Western States Water Council. Tony asks, what if any conclusions can be drawn from comparisons between recent recorded droughts with anthropogenic impacts and decadal droughts from the paleo record pre-industrialization and assuming a lack of impacts from human-related emissions? I don't know. Andy, do you want to, I guess I could, I think, uh, well, the last, I think the last couple of decades are now drier than any droughts that have been seen in the paleo record. I think there was a recent study by Park Williams that, uh, that went up to 2018. And at that point, there was one that was kind of comparable in the 1500s or something. But I think now if you include the couple of years that have happened since then, it's now drier than any in the paleo record. Um, I think it's pretty clear that for vapor pressure deficit, like we are on a trend that is being anthropogenically forced and pushing us kind of outside of natural variability. And like like we saw in both talks, I guess precipitation, it's less clear that there's any kind of forced trends in that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, oh, go ahead, Seth. Sorry, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, this is a this is a research topic, but we can take the last 20 months as I showed before. You know, that happened in a very warm climate 
And there were some droughts that happened in the 30s and 40s where precipitation wasn't quite as low, but temperatures were much, much lower to the degree that we can actually use that information to be able to parse out, you know, what are the effects on land surface conditions using our historical record to, to build up a little bit more robust line of evidence. Um, that's something that we can do and hopefully we can take on. Erica, did you want to add anything to this? Okay. All right. Um, all right. Let's move on to the next question. The next question is from Stephanie Conley, and she's asking, are there models that can link VPD to ecological factors and predictions of desertification in the U.S., especially with post-fire on the landscape? Yeah, I think um, there's definitely been a lot of advances in the representation of the land surface and things are getting there. And there, there are now like, um, yeah, dynamic vegetation models where fire can interact with vegetation, but I guess it's still kind of somewhat early stages for that. And I think many of the models that I showed don't have that degree of complexity quite yet. Uh, but it's getting there and there are models that can start to simulate that. And in our model, we have a representation of fires, they don't feed back with their emissions yet, but that it's getting there. There's also a lot of work tying, um, or maybe not a lot of work, but some some fairly recent and very high quality work tying vapor pressure deficit to, um, to fire likelihood. So I mean, fire becomes complicated because you have to have dry vegetation, which in fire world often is called fuels. Um, you also need to have high wind generally to spread a fire and you need a spark. And often in the West, um, the sparks are are the product of human infrastructure or human hum, human oopses. Um, so that vapor pressure deficit isn't the only factor, but there is quite a bit of work tying vapor pressure deficit to um, to increase likelihood of fires and to increase likelihood of large fires. Okay, um, we have a question. Uh, let's see here, I believe this is for all. Um, for the annual means, actually this might be for, um, well, I'll just pose it to all of you. For the annual means vapor pressure deficit anomalies, are those global or for the six states? And if it's for the six states, which six states were used? So I think this is probably to me, sorry if I didn't make that clear, that was the six states in the southwest of the U.S., so Colorado, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. Great. Okay. Um, we also have another question here for you, Erica. Um, solar radiation, I'm sorry, surface solar radiation has been increasing over the southern part of the southwest. Should we consider surface solar radiation as one drought indicator for its impact on ecosystem and wildlife in addition to surface temperature? Um, it is some forms of radiation, and I am not an expert on all of the different measures of radiation. Some forms of radiation, again, are contributors along with temperature and wind and humidity um, and precipitation to, to overall measures of aridity. So it's one thing. Um, I wouldn't rely on, on any one thing um, as, you know, as the indicator or saying that as solar radiation increases, it means anything that is applicable to um, to all plants and all animals or something like that. It's, it's an additional thing to keep in the mix. And for some types of cultivated and wild plants and animals, it's gonna be a, a greater contributor because of their biology than, um, or it's gonna be a greater factor than something else. But it's, it's really hard to generalize in a meaningful way about um, what these different contributors to aridification mean to different organisms. Thank you. Um, another question that's just come in, is there evidence that the seasonal temperature differences in western coastal region versus more inland regions influencing the speed of the Santa Ana winds or is it, a, or is it that a very rare or is it that it's a very rare occurrence? Well, I'll just come out and say, I don't know the answer to the question, but I do know there's some fire projects in that area that focus on it specifically. And uh, I would refer the person who asked the question to them because I know that's ongoing and um, they have a lot to um, offer. My understanding from colleagues at Scripps who work on Santa Ana winds is that 
there's not a clear indication of whether those wind patterns are likely to change. Um, there's, there's work ongoing, as Andy said, but winds are really difficult to, um, to project. And right now, there's not a strong indication that wind patterns that tend to drive fires across the West um, are likely to change as a cause of anthropogenic climate or as a consequence of anthropogenic climate change. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity um, to invite the panelists as well to, to ask each other uh, questions um, as well. But let me, I'd like to take this opportunity as the moderator to ask a question, and maybe this is going into a part of the, the work, Andy and Isla, that you did that you weren't able to talk about, but, um, and hopefully I can phrase this correctly as a lay person, but, you know, we keep using the term, you have been using the term aridification, and aridification has, it, 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 the connotation with it is that it's permanent, right, as opposed to a drought, which is an extreme event, which implies that there is an end point. So I guess how do we reconcile, how are you reconciling the use of the word aridity with this idea, Isla and Andy, that you put in the report, which I would recommend everybody checking the chat box because we provided you a link to the report, when you tried to answer the question, when is it going to end? So I, I don't know, Vandi, do you want to go first or? Um, why don't you go first? <laughs> well, I guess I guess I have a yeah. The question that I have is is really kind of what's the relative role of the precipitation versus the vapor pressure deficit, like quantitatively in what we're seeing? Because we have seen kind of natural declines in precipitation, and I think we expect that would probably end. Um, but we've also got this increasing temperature, which presumably is increasing the evaporation from the soils. And that's kind of what I would think of as aridification. And that I don't think we're expecting to end. But I've, I don't think we have, a very, at least I don't have a very good handle on like the relative importance of those two things in kind of soil moisture evolution over the last couple of decades in the real world. We can look at our models and try and quantify it. But of course, our models are not perfect. So. Um, yeah, I guess I divide it up into kind of the temperature impacts and the precipitation impacts, which are coupled together. But on top of that, there's the anthropogenic forcing, which okay. is clearly making it warmer. Yeah, I just want uh, to add on a little bit to that. Um, aridification has a connotation that it's a secular trend and there will be no recovery, whereas drought does have a recovery, like you said, Viva. So it's just completely cyclical. It depends on the baseline that you look at, um, and that's sector specific. Um, so if you're used to water demand, say, based on a baseline of like 1950 to 2000, perhaps that's something that you can use. But really, in the science community, we're not very good at separating this right now. Um, we're using projections of climate models like, you know, 50 years from now and saying, well, drought 50 years from now compared to a climate of like 50 years in the past, it'll be so much more prevalent. But that may not be the right question there because that may be part of an aridification component or a secular trend that has no recovery. So it, it we I think with the science community, there needs to be a little bit more of an interaction with the stakeholder community about how we characterize these things and what this means for stakeholder based and informing informative science. So it's it, it's it's a great question. It's something that we bat around a lot, and um, I don't think that uh, the science community nor the stakeholder community has all the answers for that right now. Fair enough. Okay, Erica, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, if if you think about it in a in a pretty general sense, I mean, kind of following up on what Isla and Andy said, you know, there are different parts of the Southwest that are more or less arid if you want to think about it in a baseline sense. So the the Sonoran Desert is drier than um, than areas further to the north, and plants and animals have adapted to that level of overall aridity. Um, you can still have a drought in an arid place. You can still have a high water year in an arid place, and so that's kind of superimposed on overall aridity. And so if you have a long-term trend of, of aridification, in theory, plants and animals can adapt to that. Um, there are still going to be periods of extremes, of extreme water limitation, even in an arid system, or of water abundance in an arid system. So you can kind of think of it as um, kind of an overall characteristic of an area versus something that's um, 
generally thought of as more temporary, as others have said. Great. Well, thank you. I want to say thank you again to the panelists. This has been a, a very um, great uh, last several minutes spending time with you. Um, we appreciate the presentations. Um, at this time, we are going to uh, take a break. We will have a 15 minute break um, to allow folks to get up and stretch, grab a snack, whatever. Um, the next session will begin promptly at 12.55 Eastern Daylight Time. And I also wanted to call your attention, if you are interested during the break, we will be showing a drought trivia question um, in, the, um, in the questions box. We will give you the answer after we come back from the break, and you will know we are coming back from the break because you will, you will hear a series of bell chimes. So um, as you can see, the poll question has been put, the trivia question has been put up, Please enjoy your break and we will see you back at 12.55 in 15 minutes. Thank you.
Okay, I'm going to, um, we all heard the bell. Thank you so much. I'm going to give uh, folks just a few more seconds here to um, come back to the meeting and then we can get started. Okay, so welcome back everyone from the break. Um, I hope you were able to, able to find um, a little bit of respite from all the presentations and are coming back refreshed with some new questions. So the trivia question over the break was, what is the average annual precipitation for Nevada? Um, the correct answer, drum roll, is 10.2 inches. And just to follow up, if you were curious, 5.9 inches was the minimum, and that happened only last year in 2020. 17.8 was the highest annual total from 1983, and 9.8 is the median and not the average. So a little bit of uh, stats 101, taking you back to median and average. Um, all right, so I am going to go ahead and start us off with the next panel. Give my team a chance. There we go. Thank you. So uh, the next panel is bringing together sector-based and community-based perspectives on the cascading impacts of drought. So it is my pleasure to introduce the next set of panelists. Um, first up, we will have Terry Fankhauser, who is the Executive Vice President of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. Next is Deanna Ikea, who is a Senior Water Policy Analyst at the Central Arizona Project, or CAP. And she focuses on implementing policies and programs to protect and enhance the project's Colorado River water supply. And then we will be rounded out with Bitta Becker, Bitta is currently serving as an associate attorney for the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. She also serves on the leadership team for the Water and Tribes Initiative in the Colorado River Basin, co-leading the universal access to clean water for tribal communities um, on the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission and on the Navajo Nation Water Rights Commission. So quite a, a group of panelists to hear from. I'm going to go ahead and um, remind you all again that following a bit of Becker's presentation, we'll be taking a few questions. So continue to put your questions into the questions box. Um, so first off, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Terry Fankhauser. Terry, if you want to go ahead and turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Great. My name is Terry Fankhauser, as indicated, I'm with the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. Uh, I've been with the organization, I guess I could say in years, or I could say in cycles of drought um, as, as we've moved through this. I'm going to use sort of uh, Colorado as an example for talking more broadly about the Southwest, and then agriculture as an example to talk more broadly about a variety of industries. Um, obviously, we focus on water as, as sort of the direct implications and lack of availability uh, due to drought, but there are associated issues as well. So move to the next slide. As I indicated, um, you know, the, this, this a lot is from our Department of Natural Resources, but I think it's very applicable. Um, we continue to face evolving impacts from a multi-year severe drought episode. And drought, of course, is part of the normal cycle of, of, as we've learned from other speakers. And, and I believe most of us understand very clearly, it seems to be increasing and, and it continues to reveal that droughts of the past are not the same as the droughts of the future. Uh, in Colorado, that's been one of the evolving sort of notions and mindsets that has created a more broad spectrum uh, planning approach um, and, and really trying to reach toward a marker of resiliency. So we have a number of things that are set up in the state. And the reason I'm going to use Colorado as an example, I do believe, and I'll, I'll, 
I'll begin with this. I believe that consistency of approach, um, a solid database of information, um, and uh, while we may not agree, agree entirely on how we address response or what the response is or what ultimately resiliency looks like because we have to maintain that in order to have industries and communities persevere. We do, we do need to look through uh, a bit of a consistent lens. So in Colorado, how we've sort of dealt with this is through our state drought response task force. I've been on a number of these throughout the year um, within these response task forces, we have a number of individualized working groups or, or sub task forces, if you will. We have a water availability task force that continues to meet mon monthly because obviously, you know, the provisioning of water both within state and along specifically the Colorado River and the upper and lower basins is something that is very real and prevalent as a result of drought and is 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 and could be its own entire topic of discussion. Um, and then we break that down further into agriculture, energy, municipal, and wildlife. And each one of these task forces dig deeply into um, uh, and, and during the activated plan, but they dig deeply into um, aspects of response and driving toward a better sense of resiliency, predictability, things along those lines. And as I said, we all work under the same auspices and general understanding that droughts are changing, they're more severe, and they're more impactful in and of themselves, but also uh, as a multiplier over time. So we'll switch slides again. I don't know if I clicked on some, there we go. Just a little delay. Uh, this may seem biased from my background and perspective, but I'll get to an economic component that 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 we've uh, we've really modeled that sort of indicates why the statement that agriculture communities bear the brunt of a drying landscape um, and that investment in that food supply and rural resilience is important. And this is one of the things Colorado has has really begun to focus on because um, food production obviously is a is a requirement of life. Um, a great deal of our water availability goes to that of food production. And as we see these increased droughts, uh, we start to see those impacts to those food producing communities uh, and, and all associated industries uh, and, and society become increasingly more impacted. So just a few background points. 2020 is the first time since 2012 that Colorado experienced a statewide or 100% drought. Um, severe drought has, has uh, taken place. And I just looked back sort of through my 20 some year tenure and look to see how many um, actually declared and designated droughts have taken place. And we, we've, we've had that happen in 2020 or 2002, 2012, 2018, and now of course in 2021. A lot of our drought has been centered in the Southeast part of the state, but this year, uh, obviously um, our Western slope um, has really been impacted uh, very significantly, as was a year ago uh, with, with strong drought. Uh, monsoon seasons were absent. Uh, as you all know, we had record high temperatures, low snowfalls, uh, winds, ultra low humidity, dust contributes to snowpack melt early, and then ultimately the element of fire and wildfire on the landscape as being a resulting aspects as well as causative aspects of, of, of drought. Um, we've had record wildfire seasons as have many uh, states in the West. Those are very impactful and they have a multiplier effect on, on water systems and supplies due to uh, sedimentation and things like that coming with those storm events following that severe drought or se severe wildfire. And we see tremendous impacts to local communities uh, from that to the to the wildlife to the naturally functioning resource 
uh, in some cases having to fully reconstruct irrigation infra infrastructure and then ultimately way, uh, water treatment facilities. So it becomes very, very expensive as you, as you continue to add the multipliers of drought moving forward. So we've tried to analyze what those impacts are and we have a, a good amount of information uh, that's been anal analyzed within the state. Um, but if we continue to see the pace at which we see drought and the, and the increasing impacts of drought as we've seen throughout our recent past, by 2050, it's estimated that drought may cost Colorado an additional $830 million in annual damages. And of that, $511 million will come from ag alone. And uh, I can't imagine what those numbers, if we were to analyze those systematically throughout the Southwest, how significant and large that number might be. Um, but as you can see, that's a tremendous amount of, of impact from drought alone uh, in, in one state of many. Move to the next slide here. I think we had something pop out of order. There we go. So as we look and analyze what a response to drought looks like, because that's really the focus of these drought task forces, we start to look at different resource bases and try to understand what exists out there. And I think this goes to my message of consistency and understanding, um, because we have to be able to respond in a, in a way that has meaning. So Declarations, as we all know, come into play traditionally uh, from public agencies at varying levels um, and, and, and varying levels of government. And they mean certain things to certain sectors of business. Um, they're very basic in, in a lot of sense, and they're not intended to solve all of the problems that exist. So we need what we learn from that and what we understand is, is that industries alone also need to step forward and engage in, in whatever a response might look like. We can't solely depend on you know, an agency response to, to drought. Uh, there is uh, though typically significant and far reaching technical assistance that we can capitalize on in the case of drought. A number of agencies within agriculture, but certainly across other business sectors tend to provide technical assistance. Uh, and information and uh, um, people power. Funding, um, funding. We, we've compiled a list of state and national funding in Colorado just to look at it through the lens of, of agriculture. Uh, I believe that each sector that I mentioned before has done that. It is linked in this presentation. If those are made available later, I'm not gonna go to that now. But I think that's important that we all have, a con again, a consistent understanding of what is available what those funding resources can contribute to and what they don't, more importantly, what they don't contrib contribute to. Uh, okay. And then programming, and that's where I believe uh, states have a tremendous role to play. And, and I really do appreciate and like the structure that's been implemented in Colorado related to drought response programming. Um, it's been consistent over the years. It varies a little bit. Uh, year over year, but for us to systematically respond to drought, it's important that we have this opportunity in front of us. I always bring this up because because individuals believe that there's some more broad, significant response to drought as there is wildfire uh, from the federal government, but presidential drought emergency declarations are possible, but they're extremely rare. They're made available through the Stafford Act. If you want to if you want to dig into that, um, as they're defined as a natural catastrophe, more time, I believe there's only two instances in history where a drought in a certain area has been allowed to be designated through a presidential declaration. Uh, in most cases, those have been denied. So that's important to understand what the extent and the length of that is. Hey, Terry, I pardon yeah. the interruption. You have two minutes left. Thanks. Perfect. States should have a drought plan. I think those need to be coordinated and monitored. Um, there needs to be some sort of response situation due to drought and mitigation on short and long-term levels. I'm gonna reference in the next slide, I believe just a couple of things and then uh, 
if I can get it to trans transition. Again, I mentioned resiliency, so let's just flip to the next slide. Colorado has um, modeled a number of, uh, this is partially, you can see here, some of the resiliency metrics that agriculture is trying to put in place to assist with drought, uh, as well as climate issues in the state. Currently, this industry sector that I'm from has about 1.9% of the greenhouse gas emission uh, components, and we're ever increasing that going toward a climate neutrality. We'll switch to the next slide. I'm going to point two websites out to you, and I would uh, I would encourage you to take a look at both of these. One's a visualization, st a visualization story about drought and the impacts of drought, and then the other goes into future avoided costs and exploring what those look like and what sort of actions be taken. These are very important because communicating drought in a way that's understood to the community at large is something that we don't spend a lot of time on. This does that through industry sectors. The last slide available speaks to some of the recommendations that were made uh, through Colorado. I'm going to leave you to read those and the proceeds from, from this presentation, but my experience as we've moved through with my industry segment in this state indicates that we need a really strong local to regional coordinated um, uh, process and regional meaning at regional in the United States but we need to be consistent in our approach year over year. And uh, um, that's the one thing that I think that we look for as we look beyond our geographic borders or beyond our industries is the way to consistently approach and address a more resilient response to drought. So with that, I'll yield and uh, appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Terry. And I'm looking, I'm hoping that you're going to be able to join um, the panels on um, the next couple of days to talk a little bit more about these recommendations. There's some really interesting forward thinking um, ideas here. So next up, um, thanks again, Terry. Next up, we're going to hear from Deanna Ikea from the Central Arizona Project. Deanna. Hi there. Thanks for having me. I'm going to uh, start out with the next slide. Uh, by just going over uh, a brief overview of the Central Arizona Project, uh, the CAP, so that you can have a little bit of perspective of our focus and issues and also do um, a little bit of orientation of the Colorado River, which is the sole source of water for the CAP. So just looking big picture wise, you'll see Lake Powell as the blue body of water up at the northern central border of Arizona which then flows down through the Grand Canyon to Lake Mead, which is on the western, northwestern tip there of Arizona. Then it flows down uh, south from there along the western border of Arizona, which is also the border with California. And then it flows on south to Mexico. And you'll see the black line that cuts through Arizona there, that is the CAP Canal. So it, we take out at Lake Havasu, we deliver the water over a 336 mile canal and deliver that water over to the Phoenix area and south to through the Tucson area. So this engineering marvel um, actually goes under 10, uh, goes through 10 siphons, which takes the canal under major riverbeds and also major highways. And it also tunnels through four mountains. We also operate Lake Pleasant, which is located about halfway across on the canal. And this, uh, this reservoir helps us to manage our water deliveries as well as our power usage. We deliver about 500 million gallons on an average year or about 1.4 million acre feet to about 60 customers. Those customers include municip municipal water users, tribal contracts, and agriculture. And in recent years, um, we've made contributions to Lake Mead. And so those deliveries are actually not deliveries where we leave that water in Lake Mead. And when I say 60 customers, like one of those customers could be the city of Phoenix, where they then take a delivery of CAP water, treat it for drinking water purposes, and then deliver it through their distribution system to customers like, like myself. So in order to deliver this water, um, looking at the next slide, we'll look at, um, one of the major components, which is that we need a lot of power in order to deliver this water. We have to lift that water nearly 3,000 feet uphill in order to deliver it. It's run through 14 pumping plants, 
the water is lifted by a pumping plant. The very first one actually has the largest lift of about 800 feet. Um, we lift it up, it flows down by gravity over several miles, and then it's lifted up by the next, uh, by the next pumping plant. So in order to do all that pumping, um, we use a lot of power. So about 2.5 million megawatt hours each year. So that makes us Arizona's largest energy user. So by delivering the water to Arizona's two largest municipal areas, the Phoenix and Tucson area, we serve nearly 80% of Arizona's population. And also we deliver to a large agricultural area that's located between Phoenix and Tucson. And that represents about 40% of the state's agriculture. So this water supports over $100 billion of, of Arizona's economy. Next, please. In order to, to meet those energy needs, the CAP continues to utilize energy markets, both long-term and short-term. And that complements our long-term resources, which includes Hoover power, solar, and Salt River project power. Um, we will also be seeking additional long-term resources in the coming years that could include other renewable supplies and natural gas resources. The system configuration of the CAP helps to manage our power needs. So you remember I mentioned Lake Pleasant. Um, we pump from the Colorado River and, and hold it in Lake Pleasant, and we pump that during the winter when the overall energy costs are higher. And then we deliver from Lake Pleasant to the majority of our water users in the Phoenix and Tucson areas during the summer when we can actually generate power from the new Waddell Dam that uh, creates Lake Pleasant. And we can uh, use the power resources from that as well as make deliveries. And also the staff manages our power purchases to minimize our power costs. So for instance, when there was that ice storm event in Texas, uh, we were able to sell some of our, our power resources uh, during that time um, and not use as much and sell it to those who, who did need it. So our main power source used to be the Navajo Generating Station. However, that was decommissioned in 2019 in order to meet very aggressive carbon-free goals. So one of the major challenges in meeting our energy needs uh, will be uh, finding other sources to meet those base load uh, needs. Uh, renewable resources such as uh, solar can't meet the energy needs during extreme conditions. So we will need to still rely on uh, sources such as natural gas, coal, and, and nuclear to meet those baseload requirements. So power is, uh, we, and we do use some of the hydropower, um, as you saw, as, uh, um, Hoover, Hoover Dam power being one of our resources that is a Colorado River hydropower supply and so power is uh, definitely of importance to the CAP but also obviously the water supply. So next slide please. The Colorado River is a water resource to seven states in the U.S. as well as to Mexico serving over 40 million people and you all probably have seen us in the headlines lately uh, with the release of a report specifically with the release of a report in August that called out that we will be in shortage operations for Lake Mead in 2022. So I need to dive a little bit into some of the background of Colorado River operations in order to understand our operations and where we are now. So the Colorado River is governed by compacts, treaties, court decrees, and agreements that span back all the way to 1922. Currently, Lakes Mead and Powell are operated in a coordinated way, and this was negotiated and agreed upon in the 2007 guidelines. And I'll talk about that one a little bit in, in a, other slides. Um, so water that is released from Glen Canyon Dam, so Lake Powell, the, that volume is specified in what's called this 24-month study. And the, the graph that you see there is the result of the August 24-month study. And this, this study is a report that shows projections of reservoir conditions over the next two years. And that model relies on initialization with current reservoir conditions, as well as using current short-term temperature and precipitation forecasts to determine what our next 24 months might look like. So yeah. every month, yes. So just a time check, you have roughly two minutes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, so much to talk about. I will, I will skim through this. The important point I'd like to say here is that um, you'll see the wide ranging uh, possibilities um, of what might be the, the reservoir elevations in Lake Powell. Um, 
and you'll see in the minimum probable case, which is the yellow line, um, you'll see that, um, and so that represents um, 90, 90th, uh, the 90th percentile, that 90% of, um, of the scenarios run to come up with this um, are higher than that. So this is obviously the low, um, that we're dipping below the minimum power pool um, elevation in 2023. Um, and so uh, that also impacts not only just the power generation, but things, pro uh, programs such as the salinity control program and a fish recovery program um, in the upper basin. And I would also like to point out that while hydropower is an important resource on the Colorado River, um, the dams that create Lake Powell and Mead were authorized first for flood control, then water supply, and then uh, for hydropower. Next slide, please. So then this is also the 24 month study results of Lake Mead. And what this just shows is that um, the projections for Lake Mead are below the gold dashed line, which is the, the first tier of shortage of 1075. And that's projected at the end of 2021. So therefore that's why we will be operating in shortage conditions in 2022. And you'll see our projections looking forward is that those look even lower um, at the end of 2022, uh, meaning that we could be at the next level of shortage by 2023. Um, the minimum power pool at Lake Mead is 950 feet, so we are not quite at that level yet, but of course that is still um, of a concern to us. I'll just skim to the next slide, please. Um, what I wanted to say is that with projections like this and, and what we've been hearing all morning, what are we doing on the Colorado River? Um, what this shows is the elevation of Lake Mead starting in 2000 up to the current time. And the blue boxes on top are the timings of the implementation of major agreements on the river. Um, I don't have time to go into all of those, but what you can see is that we've been, we've been working and doing a lot of things cooperatively throughout the basin. Um, each of those blue boxes represent a lot of work by a lot of people. Um, those agreements take months, if not years of negotiations to get to yes. Um, and each of those um, agreements shown there change the operations of the river and then thus the outcomes of the elevations. The green boxes are also some important programs that were put in place. And um, as you can see before the green boxes, you'll see the precipitous decline of Lake Mead um, starting in the 2000s. But we implemented some programs that as you can see, um, kind of flattened the curve there a little bit. And we've been kind of hovering over that red line, which was that first tier of shortage. And that pilot system conservation program and the lower basin uh, reservoir protection MOU actually laid some of the foundation for that last agreement box shown the drought contingency plan. Um, so next slide, please. We that, are that can, time. So if you want to um, wrap it up, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. What I'd like to say here is that the, so this is just a diagram of the DCP. Um, it involved a lot of parties, the US federal government, seven states and two countries, the US and Mexico. Um, it took a lot of work to get this done. Next slide. I just want to say that it impacted, the DCP impacted Arizona the most because the priority of CAP, we are the lowest priority on the Colorado River system. And so therefore it impacted us the most. And in order to get DCP passed in Arizona, um, we had to we had to get some mitigation components in place. We had to identify the resources to provide that. And also there was an additional offset component, which I can't go into right now. Um, but in other words, it took 11 agreements in just Arizona alone to get DCP passed in Arizona. And next slide, please. Um, in addition to negotiating um, discussions on the river, we've done a lot of drought adaptation actions at the CAP itself. We have a climate adaptation plan, we participate in research and the development and use of emerging data, and we are partnering with other utilities to, uh, to better adapt to what this new environment might be. So we are definitely reliant on precipitation and temperature that occurs in the Colorado River Basin, but also on the forecasts and the work that's being done uh, by folks um, here attending attending this and working on the things that you all talked about this morning. Um, so we appreciate the work done by NOAA and, and others, and we are uh, depending on you for a lot of our data moving forward. Thanks. Thanks so much. That presentation was full of great information. Appreciate it. Don't go too far because we will have a QA. and a um, Great. Thank you so much, Deanna. Next up, we're going to hear from Bitta Becker uh, from the Navajo Nation. Bitta? 
If you are talking, we can't hear you, but I think Mike is off because I can hear some rustling. Oh, shoot. Um, all right, give us one second. Vita, you say you are speaking. We still can't hear you. Um, oh. Viva, she just needs to unmute herself. So, Vita, there. Oh, is that you, Vita? Yes, I apologize. And I oh, apologize. no worries. <laughs> no problem. Did you want to uh, turn your camera on or did you want to leave it off? Okay, my camera is on. That's what threw me. Okay. Um, I, I'm, it's showing a blood. I don't know why. I apologize. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Let's go ahead and, and get started with your presentation. And I'm happy to reduce time to, to make up for anything. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't worry about it. We will make up for it. Don't worry about it. Please, yeah, continue with your whole presentation. Okay, well, I, again, thank you. I wanted to start by thanking you for allowing me to join this presentation. Um, the, the way I titled this presentation was Navajo Nation at the Heart of All Things Drought. So what I, I only have two slides. I, I'm not a technical person. I've been very impressed with the previous presentations. Um, but you can see the Navajo Nation right in the center of the Colorado River Basin, upper and lower basin. And I chose this map because it highlights some of the other tribes that are in the Colorado River Basin. So I don't wanna forget the sister tribes that are out there um, dealing with the same issues that we're talking about today. In addition to these 10 tribes that you see, there are uh, 20 other federally recognized tribes, 20 other tribes. What this map doesn't show is all of the tribes around Phoenix. Um, when Deanne was talking about the DCP, I, I do want to recognize the Gila River tribe down by Phoenix and the Colorado River Indian tribes who were very much part of those DCP conversations. So I think that's probably the first point I'm trying to make, which is that um, not only are these conversations, as Deanne pointed out, um, lengthy, um, uh, challenging, they also need to be, they need to include voices uh, such as the tribal voices that have historically not always been part of some of these conversations concerning water management issues. Um, but it's very encouraging that these two tribes were heavily involved in the DCP conversations. So if you're interested in learning more about tribes, specifically in the Colorado Basin, I realize this webinar is about more than that. I really encourage you to check out that um, that link that I have posted. It's to a Bureau of Reclamation report that was issued in 2019 that uh, was followed the heels of the Colorado River Basin report, and this report was focused on the on tribes and the water supply that uh, the Colorado River Basin water supply as it relates to these 10 tribes that you see. is that It's estimated that these 10 tribes have um, rights to about 20% of the Colorado River supply. So let me stop there and move on to Navajo Nation uh, focused uh, discussion, which is the next slide. And again, I apologize for the map, um, but I chose this one because it is a map showing the waters of the Navajo Nation is the way we like to describe it. And you can find this online so that, and I post the link that you, where you can find it so that you can get a better version of it. Um, but the blue lines are waters of the Navajo Nation. So, but how does this all relate to drought? I'm gonna start, at, well, let me back up and say, it, you know, the Navajo Nation is a sovereign entity. It's about the size of West Virginia in land mass. We have over 300,000 what are called members and over half of those members, 175 to 200,000 live on the, on the reservation. And as I started with, we are at the heart of all things drought. Uh, the last time I spoke to Noah a couple months ago, um, the Navajo Nation, uh, the, all of the Navajo Nation was in severe to exceptional drought conditions. 
when I checked last night, I'm happy to report that we are no longer in severe drought location um, status. I mean, exceptional drought location. We, but all of the Navajo Nation is in uh, some form of drought. At the beginning of the year, 75% of the Navajo Nation was in exceptional drought, 75%. And we have been dealing with drought for many years now. We are very much in the epicenter of, of what's happening with this mega drought. So what does it mean for the people? And that's what I think I can bring to this conversation is how does drought affect life on the Navajo Nation? As many of you know um, about, well, too many of our people lack access to clean drinking water in their homes. So it's estimated that 30 to 40% of the homes in the Navajo Nation lack clean drinking water. That means we have people who go to water hauling stations, including some operated and maintained by the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, wh where I work. Um, over the summer, one of those water hauling stations, um, th we had was pulling too much groundwater, too, too much water out of its groundwater supply. And it was not the clean drinking water, water haulers that were pulling that water, it was our ranchers. So our ranchers were very much feeling the drought, it was impacting their livestock. So they, were, they started to haul clean drinking water, which is not necessarily required for livestock, um, but they were starting to pull that, that water from one of our water hauling stations. Well, that had the effect of threatening one of our community water systems. So I'm just pointing out how our, our, our systems here, how interconnected they are, so that where, you know, in some communities in the United States, a uh, drought would affect your ranchers and your municipal water supply would never feel it, right? Your city would never know that the ranchers were um, were were being affected by drought. But here are our, our people pull, turning on their taps in, in at least one community was feeling that effect of the drought. Um, so let me move to the, uh, let me move from the water hauling to just recreation. You can kind of see Lake Powell, and I'm, I'm non-technical, I'm a lawyer, because I'm going to say in the upper left-hand corner, instead of giving you the directions, but I guess that's the northwest corner, you can see Lake Powell. And every, I'm sure everybody on this webinar knows what's happening at Lake Powell. What people may not know is we have a developed recreational uh, tourism economy based around Lake Powell. So the drought that's affecting the natural system is also affecting parts of our economy. Um, just want to underscore what Deanne said about hydropower. And I heard your point that, you know, the dams were created first for flood control. I, I think in some ways the hydropower issue may be the most fascinating, meaning um, one, it's carbon free, and that's very important in this day and age. But as an equity issue, um, the majority of power that the Navajo Nation, that NTUA, the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, I should be specific here, uh, uh, purchases for use on the Navajo Nation comes from the Colorado River system and Hoover Dam. And this power is some of the cheap, or is the cheapest power in the Southwest. So as these power supplies are threatened, what also becomes threatened is the the ultimate cost to users who arguably cannot afford higher cost power. Um, hey, Bida, this is your time check. You have three minutes. Oh, great. Um, so, and lastly, I wanted to just kind of touch on um, feral horses and wildlife. I, I had the great privilege of directing the Navajo Nation Division of Natural Resources um, immediately prior to this position that I'm in. And what Fish and Wildlife taught me was that the wildlife can find water sources. They move around, they understand where um, water is providing. Regrettably, it means they may have to move off the reservation um, in order to find those water sources. But the group of animals that are incapable of finding water sources are what we call feral horses. Um, and 
I don't know how many of you are aware that feral horses is a challenge in much of the West. Um, these are large animals that travel in packs and, and erode the surface. And so these animals have suffered greatly with the drought because they don't have the natural instincts that wildlife do to find, um, to find wild water sources. So again, just sort of trying to pull together for you all listening today, how water is really at the heart of not just the Navajo Nation's existence, but all of humankind's existence. Um, and as we go into, uh, as, as we work our way through this drought scenario, I, and this comment is really meant for next week, but I wanted to foreshadow it. I, I agree with Deanne that, you know, we can work through these issues. I think what's fascinating is that we're working through them in a time of COVID-19, in a time where we're talking about equity in a way that we've never um, discussed before. So thank you for this time. I hope I was able to give you some insight into how drought's affecting the Navajo Nation. And um, I look forward to any questions. Thank you so, so much, Beda. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite all of our panelists um, that are able to turn on their camera um, to do so, uh, to participate in uh, some Q&A. Um, I'm going to start out of the gate with a question for you, Deanna, from the audience, which is, how is population growth and projected growth in Arizona impacting CAP planning for the future? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I would like to point out that the population growth in Arizona has, has I think, seven times over since, I'll say, the 1950s. Um, however, our water use has gone down overall. So the conservation efforts that are being done by our municipal providers, um, and uh, the thing is, is that CAP uh, cannot mandate conservation or things like that uh, that tie directly to population growth. But however, the uh, we do participate in conservation and support that conservation by the municipalities. Um, so that's that's how we participate in that. And we certainly do plan for it um, in, in our demands. However, we are mostly tied now to um, how much is available to us through the DCP um, and the different cuts. Thank you. Um, we also have a question for uh, Terry. Um, sorry, I had it up here. One a second, let me grab it really fast. Okay, Terry, a question from the audience. Does the size of the farm operation correspond to an individual's ability to prepare and adapt to drought? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think, I'm sure there's variability in that depending on, you know, where and the, what the situation and the conditions are with individuals. But I, I would say yes. I think that as with many businesses, we see um, consolidation and, and increase in size and or we see decrease inside the middle of our industries are all shrinking and a lot of that has to do with the ability to withstand and bear um, situations that are beyond their control or scope or, or or even their planning so larger operations i think have a better sense of durability because they have an ability to put reserves aside in some cases and be able to withstand these sorts of events. They also might have greater flexibility in land and water use uh, that's available to them, the ability to afford enhanced technology and things like that. So yes, I do think there is, there is relevance to that question. And I think as we scale resiliency and response, we have to take that into consideration. Great. Um, this question is for all of the panelists, um, but I would love to, to start with Beta, so I'll put you on notice here. What coordination is needed that is not already happening to support drought response efforts? So from my vantage point at the Navajo Nation, you know, we um, are located in three states, or I like to say three states are located in the Navajo Nation. And, you know, nature knows no boundaries. 
So I think that there could be greater coordination uh, by the states, but let me say it this way. Uh, and I get that everybody's um, overburdened, under-resourced. I think some regional, strategic regional planning that that does that is not bound to legal legal lines that nature doesn't see would be would be very helpful in certain parts of of the west and let me be very clear um when up in the northwest new mexico you know 20 years ago they started working on shortage sharing agreements on the san juan river right that's the kind of thing you know if you could move those sort of agreements at a more local level. So Deanna was talking about the state of Arizona working statewide, which is wonderful. That's a huge landmass. And then the states, but how do you bring that down so that like your ranchers feel the impact, right? Or your municipal water systems feel that coordination. I think that's something that that I think could be greatly improved. Okay. How about um, Deanna or Terry? Did you want to take a take a shot at answering that question from your perspective. You want to go ahead, Terry, or I have some comments too. Okay. <laughs> um, it, I find it a little bit hard to, to answer that one because my initial response is that there is so much coordination already happening. I mean, all of those agreements that I talked about are happening at the multi-state level, the binational level, um, but certainly as, as Vida pointed out that, I mean, there needs to be more um, and there will be um, in order to get through uh, the next few years, the, the 2007 guidelines that I mentioned will expire at the end of 2026. And so we need to have something in place to replace that. So those uh, discussions have already started. Um, but certainly one thing that I've noted is that, I mean, I would always take more data. I mean, if we could have more funding to have consistent and more <laughs> data of uh, what's happening um, with our, our system, the, the river, the, the flows, um, the, the weather, the, I mean, all of that, that's what I would say. Um, I will say that there has been some money um, identified by the, the federal government, the Bureau of Reclamation has put some money forward uh, as drought response. Um, it may not be um, that federal drought response that Terry had, had talked about, um, but they are making funds available to, to put additional programs in place. Yes, so. okay. And Terry, I'll give you the last word before I close this Q&A out. Yeah, I do. I, I think probably some better, more enhanced coordination is probably necessary, but it's kind of the old the old notion and the old adage that you know we may have all the resources and all the elements available to us that we that we need we just aren't sort of consistent and applied and outcome based in our approach so i think some of that bears standing back uh, when it's not during a significant drought and actually trying to determine if we did it right the last time and we're prepared for the next time would be my would be my comment. Right, good. Well, thank you again, Bitta and Terry and Deanna for your time and for your presentations. We are going to go ahead and continue this discussion with our next panel. So we're gonna continue discussing community and sector-based perspectives on cascading drought impacts. Uh, for this session, we have four panelists joining us, and I'll go ahead and briefly introduce them before I turn it over to them. Kevin Moran is the Director of the State and Federal Water Policy Advocacy for Environmental Defense Fund's Resilient Water Systems Program. Chris Perkins is the Senior Director at the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, which is America's leading coalition of outdoor recreation trade associations and organizations. We also have Jesse Bell, who is a professor of water, climate, and health in the Department of Environmental, Agricultural, and Occupational Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, as well as the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And then to round it out, we have Bill Hazenkamp, who is the manager of Colorado River Resources for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. So I will first turn it over to Kevin Moran. And for the rest of you, if you'd like to turn your cameras off, you can, and thank you.
Thanks. Go ahead, Kevin. Thanks very much. It's an honor to be with you all today and to learn from so many experts. We who live in the West know that we're facing interconnected crises, a wildfire, extreme heat, and drought. The climate crisis is hitting home. We're far beyond the place where it was once an academic discussion about future impacts. The climate crisis is disrupting lives, homes, and livelihoods for millions of people in the West and in the world. Human-caused climate change is increasing drought risk across much of the United States as rising temperatures accelerate evaporation, increase water uptake by heat-parched plants, and reduce the amount of water uh, that's produced by snowpack and runoff for the dry summer months. We all know that flows in the Colorado River have declined about 20% from historical averages since 2000, and about half of that decline is attributable to a warming climate. And scientists are telling us we probably ought to be preparing for an additional decline in river flows of 14 to 31% by 2050. I would be remiss if I didn't say up front before getting into other strategies and, and issues, we must reduce as much greenhouse gases globally as fast as possible, or the probability of increasingly bad outcomes for people and nature in the region and the world will continue to increase. The viability indeed of water and land management strategies that we'll talk about here depend on bold and comprehensive action on climate. Next slide, please. Now, the effects of uh, drought, actually, can we go back to the last one, sorry. Reverse, please, thank you. The effects of drought on the environment are compounding. It's visible on the surface. We can see lake levels declining like those of Lake Mead here, and we can see flows in rivers and streams diminishing. As surface water becomes less available, reliance on groundwater tends to increase, causing many domestic and agricultural wells to go dry. In combination with warmer temperatures, this trend can be devastating to groundwater-dependent ecosystems that are so vital to wildlife in the arid southwest. Next slide. Now, many basins in the West are suffering due to extended severe drought. The Colorado River is acutely aware of drought impacts, as you've heard already from several speakers. We're currently in the midst of a 20-year drought in most of the basin, and some are now using the term aridification, which has been debated already this morning on what it means and how to understand it. One fact, though, is that normal snowpack, what we might think of as normal snowpack, is not yielding as much water in rivers as, as was true before. For example, in 2020, snowpack was 114% of historical average, but runoff was in the 55% of historical average range. Now, these, these obviously have, these conditions have a huge impact on rivers and streams. Last summer, Colorado state agencies uh, temporarily asked uh, anglers to stop fishing parts of the Colorado River. We know that warm water temperatures threaten the health of fish and this important part of our recreational economy. On the Hopi tribe's lands in northeastern Arizona, drought has contributed to declining levels in a sacred spring where the tribe has practiced religious ceremonies for hundreds of years. Forests, of course, as we're seeing so vividly and painfully every day in the West, are susceptible to catastrophic fires. In 2020, Colorado saw the three largest wildfires in the state's history. In Arizona, over the past three years, wildfires have consumed more than half a million acres or nearly a thousand square miles. Drought makes wildfires more likely, and those fires that start burn at higher temperatures and spread rapidly. Next slide. We need transformational change in the region and in water management generally, in mindset and actions, in order to ensure water security and resilience for people and nature. First, we have to plan for the river that scientists tell us we're going to have, not the one that many of us remember or the one we might wish for. This means that modeling of future hydrology and water supplies, which is the basis of agreements and plans and so much that's important in the basin, they must be realistic. Second, 
we must begin at a bigger scale to address long-standing inequities. Residents of Navajo Nation, for example, are 67 times more likely to live without running water than other Americans. And at least one in three homes on Navajo Nation do not have running water. I would commend to you the work of the Water and Tribes Initiative and a proposal for universal clean access to water for Native Americans. Third, we need to take an all of the above, or some people call it a whole portfolio approach. Plan for reductions in water use across all sectors, major investments in recycling and reuse, resilience investments, and deciding what we mean by resilience and what outcomes we're going for. Better groundwater management. Climate smart agriculture will be critically important. It must work for rural communities and augmentation. Now EDF, next slide please. EDF and partners have created a report, 10 Strategies for Climate Resilience in the Colorado River Basin. We think these strategies are worthy of further investigation, testing, and scaling up the ones that provide provable benefits to prepare the basin for a drier water future. These strategies are part of a holistic basin-wide approach to climate adaptation for water security and other benefits. For example, uh, farmers in central Arizona are among the first to lose Colorado River supplies during the shortage that will be happening next year. EDF and partners are working with multinational tire company Bridgestone and a Pinal County, Arizona farmer on a crop switching demonstration project. Waiuli, a natural source of rubber, requires about half the water of other crops grown in the region, including alfalfa. Crops like Waiuli can be part of a solution to the region's challenges by reducing water demand while maintaining a vibrant agricultural economy. Next slide, please. We need to upgrade our aging infrastructure in agriculture so that we can use water more efficiently. And we also need to invest at a much bigger scale in our natural infrastructure and strategies on the ground that producers want to use. This includes managing our forests to increase water storage and reduce wildfire risk, utilizing dry stream beds, for example, to recharge water into aquifers while creating habitat. And we can do a lot more to incentivize climate resilient agricultural practices like the ones utilized by the Knott family, who you see here on their ranch in Colorado's Yampa River Valley. The Knott family creates grazing systems that retain winter moisture and fire breaks to mitigate damage from potential wildfire. We all know that federal policy changes and funding are essential. The bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, authorizes new funding for drought response and resilience in several important categories. 250 million for the DCP implementation that you heard Deanna talk about. 3.2 billion for tribal water projects, 2.1 billion for forest restoration, and at least 200 million for watershed health and natural infrastructure. And I would also mention that the Western Water Infrastructure Coalition joined by EDF, Trout Unlimited and others is, is urging that we do even more in other federal legislation, including the reconciliation bill now under development with a focus on achieving durable and quantifiable watershed resilience outcomes. Next slide, please. Pardon the interruption, Can, uh, you have two minutes. Very good, I'll come in on time. Uh, the stakes could not be greater for our region and our world. I think so many of us in the region can talk about our own stories of the drying land and drought and its impact on our lives at home. In the Colorado River Basin, we must evolve rapidly from a focus on managing water supplies in temporary dry periods to a mindset of managing in a permanently drier climate, which is likely. Both the pace and scale of the basin's collaborative water agreements and plans must increase. We need major investments in the health of natural systems to avoid a future of insecure communities, failing economies, and parched ecosystems. Our challenge is really a manifestation of the global question confronting our species, 
Can we adapt fast enough and in smart ways to the climate crisis to maintain human civilization as we've known it? Thank you. I look forward to the dialogue. Thank you so much, Kevin. Another great presentation, lots of opportunity for, future, for further discussion. Um, all right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Perkins. Thank you, and, and thank you, Kevin, for that presentation. I particularly enjoyed um, the slide on strategies for climate resilience that was new to me. So I was once uh, told that you have to establish your credibility as an expert in advance of a presentation. So here I submit uh, some content from my trip over the last few weeks uh, down the Colorado <laughs> River in the Grand Canyon. Um, you can press play on the video. I understand that uh, the video will not have sound, so I can um, hopefully provide some sound effects myself. That's my uh, ant in the front left, just getting totally demolished by uh, the waves in Horn Creek Rapid. It was a fantastic trip and it, it showed me firsthand the power of the Colorado River. Um, but as, as those of you watching uh, likely know, it's a deceiving video because the, uh, the, the river is dammed at the top by the Glen Canyon Dam and, and the bottom by the Hoover Dam. Uh, and they're releasing water um, to generate recreational flows year round and also uh, to generate energy. So uh, it gives the impression that there is tons of water in the Colorado River when in fact, as we know, its supplies are quite threatened. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I just wanna start by a level setting about what we mean when we talk about the outdoor recreation economy. Uh, this is an economy that covers a huge diversity of activities from human powered recreation, uh, so like hiking and biking and skiing and climbing, uh, to hunting and angling, um, uh, as well as motorized use, so like RVs and ATVs and snowmobiles. Um, all of these activities are, are highly popular in the Southwest. Uh, you can advance uh, the slide to show the graphic. Um, it's not just the recreationists themselves that comprise the industry. Um, it's all the stakeholders that have a vested interest in outdoor recreation. So looking at the private sector, you have manufacturing and retail businesses, as well as guides and outfitters. In the public sector, you have community economic development groups, tribal nations, uh, local, state, and federal agencies. And then in the nonprofit sector, you have community groups, service corps, and advocacy and trade associations. Um, next slide, please. And so when you look at this collection of stakeholders, you might suspect that this industry um, contributes massive economic value to the United States and the data does support that. Uh, what you're seeing here is courtesy of the Outdoor Recreation Satellite Account at the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which shows that outdoor recreation accounts for 5.2 million jobs across the United States. This is 3.3% of all employment, generates $788 billion in real annual gross output and contributes to 2.1% of United States GDP. And just to put this in perspective, uh, this economic contribution is, is larger than oil and gas and mining combined. Next slide, please. And, and so I work for the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, uh, which is a collection of 34 trade associations across the outdoor industry representing uh, more than 110,000 businesses and, and really the full diversity of outdoor recreation, the human powered, the hook and bullet and the motorized groups. Next slide. Uh, so if you take away nothing else from this presentation, I, I hope that you hold on to these two things. First is that uh, climate change and its impacts um, are impacting both supply and demand for outdoor recreation amenities, particularly in the Southwest. And the outdoor recreation industry is, is a huge driver for the economy of the Southwest. And without significant intervention, we'll, we'll see widespread economic and cultural impacts um, some of which have already started to occur. Uh, next slide, and you can sort of click through the animations on that one. So I, I live in the West, I live up in Victor, Idaho, and it's hard to ignore all the headlines that have come across my desk this summer about the relationship between climate change and outdoor recreation opportunities and um, quite stark impacts. Entire national forest systems closing, uh, air quality at one point in, in South Lake Tahoe was in the 400 to 500 range, if not higher. Um, I, I think I read somewhere that Denver at, at one point in the last few weeks had the fifth worst air quality in the world. Um, we're seeing climate change today and it's impacting outdoor recreation as we know it. 
you can go to the next slide. And so as I mentioned in the key takeaways, um, outdoor recreation, uh, uh, climate change is impacting both supply and demand for outdoor recreation. So you have, uh, you have this convergence of, of businesses who are unable to operate and consumers who are changing their habits. Um, in the picture in the bottom left, you, you see certain recreational sites are inaccessible due to declining water levels. That's uh, the boat ramp at the top of the, uh, of, the, of the photo there that clearly couldn't be used by a motorized boat. Uh, it's putting habitat stress on, on game and fish. And shorter winter seasons is, is impacting the supply chain for outdoor gear and apparel manufacturers. And as, also, as I've mentioned, uh, as I've mentioned, demand is changing. Um, this is a photo from just down the road for me of the Tetons, where the air quality has been quite poor this summer. Um, folks are having to choose between high quality outdoor recreation and, and their health, and we we hate to see that. And smoke is obscuring view sheds and iconic places and changing people's travel habits. And I just wanted to illustrate with a a few just really stark anecdotes. Yellowstone National Park uh, at, at points this summer closed fishing in rivers and streams from 2 p.m. to sunrise as a result of overheated uh, lakes, streams, and rivers to, to protect the fish. Um, as has probably been covered in this forum already, Lake Powell's around 38% down, which is a full 68 uh, feet below a full reservoir. And to illustrate what this means, well, there's, there's one dock system on Lake Powell that uh, has anchors which are not built for low water and those anchors had to be moved deeper and for this reason around 25 people lost their jobs about six weeks earlier than normal and the marinas lost about 25 percent of their revenue for the year so um, in these very acute ways we're seeing uh, recreational opportunities impacted around the united states you can go to the next slide and the economic consequences of uh, these climate induced outdoor recreation impacts are significant. So pulling from the same Bureau of Economic Analysis account, uh, you can see here the percentage share of GDP in southwestern states uh, contributed by uh, contributed to by outdoor recreation, and uh, in particular, the Colorado River and its associated economic activities related to outdoor recreation are, are worth about uh, $30 billion in economic expenditures. Next slide. And looking at the, the local level in, in rural communities, this has a major impact on rural livelihoods. A, a number of southwestern communities have uh, experienced declines in other major extractive industries and turned to outdoor recreation for economic stability for the following reasons. Outdoor rec increases vis visitation and economic activity, improves public health and healthcare savings, and increases property tax or property value and tax revenues. It brings in new residents. Etc. But if your outdoor recreation amenities are no longer high quality or accessible due to climate change, uh, your you know your community's uh, viability is is at risk. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to conclude by just talking about how the outdoor rec industry is taking on this challenge. Uh, ultimately, it, it's going to be the energy and transportation sector that has the most impact on on climate change in the United States, but we know as an industry that uh, our long-term sustainability relies on healthy public lands and waters. So we're actively working on a number of initiatives. One is just protecting public lands and waters uh, for their um, biodiversity, for their uh, carbon sink and um, other various uh, natural solution uh, benefits. So through the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, uh, last summer, we're, we're putting billions of dollars into public lands and waters and the infrastructure that supports them and, and helping build more climate resilient infrastructure. And we're also talking about um, the proliferation or, or the need for pro proliferation of electric charging stations on public lands. Um, as, you, as you may know, most public land and water, water uh, recreation areas don't have great electric charging infrastructure, and we don't want recreationists to have to choose between uh, buying an electric vehicle and maintaining their recreation habits because they're not sure if they can charge their vehicle at their favorite places. So we're trying to advance electric charging um, across public lands and waters. We also need to be thinking about tax credits for technologies like e-bikes that enable low carbon transport, 
transport, but can be um, financially unattainable for low-income communities. And we're excited to see that a proposal has been advanced in Congress in recent days as part of uh, the reconciliation deal that would offer billions of dollars in tax credits for e-bike purchases. And finally- Oh, I'm just gonna give you minutes. a two minute time. Okay, go ahead. Cool. Here's my last point. Uh, and this is one that's that's quite important to me. We believe really strongly that people need to experience the outdoors and develop connections with it in order to be its future advocates. And this comes from building a more diverse and inclusive outdoor industry uh, and outdoor workforce. Um, and this includes proposals like the Civilian Climate Corps, which would engage uh, millions of, of young people and, and veterans on green and blue infrastructure projects, including those which benefit outdoor recreation. So next slide. Just to recap, uh, climate change is, is having major impacts on both supply and demand for outdoor rec amenities. And because of this, um, a major driver of the Southwest economy is at stake. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Chris. Great presentation. I'm gonna hand it over now to Jesse Bell. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the impacts of drought on human health, especially in the southwestern part of the United States. Typically, when you think of drought, you might not necessarily think of um, human health or public health impacts, but maybe you're thinking more in the context of agriculture or water resources. But as we've heard from some of the other speakers today, there's a variety of other impacts that can potentially be related back to our health in a variety of different ways. Internationally, we know that droughts have likely caused more deaths than any other climate or weather related disaster over the last century. Here in the United States, we're still trying to understand some of those pathways to human health outcomes. And so there's still a lot of work that still needs to be done here in the US. But those pathways do exist and the health impacts are, are, uh, are occurring. One of the things that makes it difficult for us to understand the impacts of drought compared to other natural disasters or climate related disasters is that drought is more slow evolving. And so the impacts are not immediate uh, and typically are more delayed or indirect uh, health outcomes. Unlike what you would see with a hurricane or a flood where you see those impacts immediately and it's causing impacts within the community, but also causing impacts that are sending people to the hospital or even potentially causing deaths. And so the way that I think of it is, is drought changes the environment around us and those changes in the environment can actually be quite significant and long lasting and, and very impactful. And those changes then can lead to human health outcomes. And so drought really acts as a threat multiplier when we're talking about human health. Drought can intensify heat waves. It can change the frequency and intensity of wildfires. It can reduce water quality and quantity. It can reduce air quality. It can change vector and wildlife habitat, which then could potentially be related back to uh, the spreading of disease. And as you can see, each of these has a potential relationship with human health, and each of these is directly related to drought in some capacity. Next slide, please. And so I put this figure up here to really illustrate how we get from a drought event to human health outcomes. And so over on the far left, you have different drought types. And when a drought occurs, uh, as I've mentioned, it, it changes the environment in a variety of different ways. And here are listed out all the different ways that it can potentially change it. And then over on the far right, here are some of the potential health outcomes that can occur because of those changes in the environment. And so that's a pretty linear pathway. But it should be noted that it's not only just that drought occurs, like any other disaster, it's not that it, you know, if it occurs that you'll see health outcomes, it's really dependent upon where it occurs, when it occurs, and who's it potentially impacting. And so that's where we really have to understand the environmental institutional context and the social and behavioral context of the communities that we serve and, and the potential um, uh, places that are potentially being impacted in some way. Environmental institutional context is is basically your infrastructure, it's the, or the environment or land use management practices around the community that you serve. The social and behavioral context is really the individuals that live within that community or live within that impacted area. And so 
you know, what are the social determinants of health, occupation, are they more rural or urban populations, what is race, literacy, and age, uh, what is dependency on caregivers or pre-existing health conditions that are existing within that population. And so that's how, when we have a drought event, we can either see an increase in potential human health outcomes or a reduction, or lower levels of human health outcomes. Next slide, please. And so we know that drought is impacting human health here in the United States. Um, there's a variety of different studies that have shown this and a variety of different relationships that have shown this as well. There was a study that came out a few years ago that showed in the western part of the United States and uh, specifically that there were higher rates of mortality and hospitalizations associated with drought events, especially with populations above 65 years of age, because those populations were more at risk or more vulnerable to drought events. And so I'm doing research and other folks are doing research as well to try to better understand what are some of these causes? What are some of these pathways? And why is it that certain populations are more vulnerable or more at risk? And there's a variety of different reasons for that. And I'll get at some of that with some of these examples that I have here. So we know across the United States the, that heat waves likely cause more deaths than any other climate or weather related disaster. Internationally, it's droughts, famine, and malnutrition. US, it's heat waves. And one of the things that we know is that drought can potentially intensify heat waves. And so that can lead to a human health outcome. And we know that that's very uh, a prominent issue in the southwestern part of the United States. Last year in 2020 was a record year for Arizona as far as heat related deaths is concerned. There were around 500 heat related deaths in the, in the state, and that was a, a record year for them. And also, it changes water quality and water uh, availability. We've heard some uh, other individuals talking about uh, the, especially the impact on private domestic wells. That, that's a major concern. Uh, with some of the work that we've been doing, we've had communication with public health officials across the country. And one of the things that keeps coming up is their concern around private domestic wells. As many of you are probably aware, private domestic wells are not regulated by the EPA Safe Water Drinking uh, Act. So they do not have to fall into the same standards that uh, municipal water sources are, are uh, uh, need to uh, uh, abide by. And so one of the things that we know is that changes in climate, especially when, during drought events, there can be potential changes in water availability, which is obviously of major concern, but also water quality. And there was a study that came out of the USGS earlier this year that showed that um, during drought events, you actually see higher uh, uh, elevated levels of arsenic in domestic private wells compared to non-drought years. And so that's one more additional threat that people have to be aware of, especially if their water is not being regularly tested. That's, that's something that potentially needs to be communicated to those individuals they're in the middle of a drought that maybe that's the time to be testing their, their water source to see if it's uh, uh, potentially being contaminated. Next slide, please. Hey, Jesse, and, this is your three minute mark. Okay. Yep. And reduction of air quality is another big issue that we have, obviously because of, air, uh, because of wildfires, but also because of uh, dust. We know that there's an increase in dust storm and dust storm activity in the Southwestern part of the United States. That can cause respiratory ailment, but also it causes um, issues with traffic accidents because of visu uh, impairment of uh, visibility along roads. And then in addition, there's a fungal pathogen. It's in the Southwest part of the United States. It's been associated with um, dryness. And so as soils dry in the Southwest part of the US, those soils have a naturally occurring fungal pathogen known as coccidioidomycosis, mycosis, which is also known as valley fever. When that fungus gets up uh, because of disturbance, when that fungus gets up in the air, you can breathe it in and it can cause respiratory ailments. Next slide, please. And then the other big issue is the impacts on mental health. Internationally, Australia, um, India, and Africa have all done work around understanding the, these impacts. We also know here in the United States that agricultural workers and farmers have higher than the average um, uh, rate of suicide. And there was also a study that was done with uh, some of my colleagues at Minnesota and Iowa that showed during drought events 
there was an increased uh, reporting of uh, psychosocial stress in farmers um, associated with a, a major drought event that occurred in the central part of the United States. And so that's one more pathway that we're concerned about when we're talking about the impacts of drought on human health and the complexity of some of these relationships as well. Next slide, please. And so lastly, one of the things that I want to address is there are a number of resources that are already available. Even though that we're not thinking of drought in the context of human health, a lot of times when we're talking about it, um, CDC and other individuals out there are already kind of building the stage for, for understanding some of these relationships and providing resources to public health officials. And so there's things like the website from CDC around drought and health. Um, NIDIS has also has a, a drought and health website as well. Next slide, please. Or next uh, pop up. And, and then there's also the development of fact sheets. And then next slide, please. And then also guidance documents as well. And then hit it two more times. Um, and one of the other things that we're working on right now, and this is being funded and partnered with NIDIS, is around drought and health and trying to understand the impacts of drought and human health here in the United States. We're hosting regional workshops around the US and we're also interviewing public health officials around the US as well to try and understand what are they seeing when drought events occur? How are they responding to it? And what is the gaps in knowledge around some of these issues as well? So that they can, our hope is that we can gather this information to help them better respond and prepare for the next drought events that occur especially for the human health and public health consequences of these events. And so uh, there's still a lot of really good work to, to happen and there's a lot of really good opportunities to try to better understand some of these, um, these issues associated with public health and human health in the context of drought. And one of the things that I really wanna try to advocate for is when we're having these types of meetings, as was here today, is making sure that public health officials are potentially involved in some capacity so that we can have better preparing or better preparedness and planning around some of these issues as well. And so with that, I'll go to the, my last slide. And I just wanted to say thank you very much. And if you have any questions or comments, I'll be happy to address those or feel free to, to reach out to me afterwards as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jesse. Um, and finally, to round out this panel, um, let's hear from Bill Hazenkamp. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here today. I have to admit that Chris set the bar high as, uh, and that's not my first slide, so go to the first slide, but Chris set the bar high by having to prove that you are a, one more, one more back. There we go, thank you. Uh, having to prove you're an expert, as uh, since my agency is the largest uh, provider of drinking water in the nation, I guess the only way to demonstrate my expertise is by drinking our final product. <laughs> and yes, it does taste good. Now the next slide, please. Hmm, uh, next slide. I think I'm a little out of order. Next slide, there we go, stop there. So, um, I live in Southern California and our region is the most variable, has the most variable precipitation in all of the continental United States. Um, the coefficient of uh, variation is shown here on the graph and Southern California is the epicenter of that variation. What does that mean? It means it never rains in Southern California, but it pours, man, it pours. Our region gets about the same annual precipitation as Denver or Salt Lake City, but our variation is much higher. You heard in the uh, trivia question, Nevada's lowest and highest amount over the last 30 years was 5,000, uh, or uh, uh, five inches and 15 inches, about a three times range in precipitation. In Los Angeles, in the last 20 years, we've had a low of three inches and a high of 36 inches. So 12 times difference between the lowest and the highest. And as a result, that makes it very difficult to have a reliable water supplies in our own region. Coupled with a uh, lack of any significant river, uh, we needed to uh, 
go out of our region to have a reliable water supply. So now go backwards one because I, uh, I, I messed up in the slide. So go back one slide. There we go. So uh, Southern California, in order to be reliable, reached out to three different rivers over the years. Uh, first, the city of LA built the Los Angeles Aqueduct and tapped the Owens River to bring water to Southern California. Then 100 years ago, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California was formed to bring in water from the Colorado River. And then finally, the State Water Project, the largest water project in the nation at the time was built in the 1960s and half of the water from the Sacramento River comes into Southern California. So we have a variety of sources coming in. We have three watersheds plus our own local uh, watershed and that has been very successful to us because typically one watershed might not be as dry as another. So a drought hasn't affected or historically didn't affect all watersheds equally. So if we had a wet year on the Sacramento River, we could take more water from the river and leave more water in the Colorado River and prop up Lake Mead. Likewise, if it was dry in Northern California, we would take more in the Colorado River. So it was a connected system based on the hydrology in each of those regions. Okay, now two slides ahead, please. Apologize for uh, that, that mix up. But as we've heard, as we've seen earlier, California in the last 12 months has been both the hottest state, uh, the hottest year ever in 125 years of data and the driest uh, year ever the last 12 months. The, the dryness and the heat have been ubiquitous throughout the Southwest. And in fact, it started about, as we heard earlier, about 18 months ago. I call it the COVID drought is right when COVID was discovered in the United States is when the Western US got really hot and really dry. And I know that correlation does not mean causation, but maybe the scientists should look and see if maybe there's one other uh, side effect of COVID, a mega drought in the Southwest, who knows? Next slide. And as a result, we've seen the huge, the large reservoirs in the Western US at their record low levels either today or within the last 30 days. Uh, we've already heard about Lake Powell going down to its lowest level ever. Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the United States, hit its lowest level. And Lake Oroville, the largest reservoir in the State Water Project, also at its lowest level ever. Lake Oroville is now down below power pool. And for the first time ever, there's no power generation coming from this, uh, from California's second largest reservoir. We've heard that if next year has a 60% runoff or less on the Colorado, Lake Powell might, be, might go below power pool next year. So some pretty dire consequences uh, of the reservoirs. What we've seen during this COVID drought is the total storage of these three reservoirs has gone down by 10 million acre feet. And I think you can look at it as uh, there is a silver lining. The silver lining is these reservoirs that shows how valuable they are, that we've gotten through this terrible, terrible drought, and we've relied on 10 million acre feet from these reservoirs to protect the environment, to, to feed, uh, uh, deliver water to our farms and keep our cities thriving. But we've run out of our buffer and we have to ramp up even more, of course. Next slide. So while uh, Southern California is experiencing this uh, with everyone else, this record drought, so far we have not had to ration water or mandate water conservation in our service area. Northern California is under mandatory conservation, but so far Southern California is not. We've been successful in getting through this COVID drought uh, over the last 18 months. We are under a 15% mandate, 15% uh, voluntary conservation that the governor is looking for, and, and we've echoed that message. But the reason that we are successful up to this point has been three things I want to highlight. One is uh, uh, developing partnerships, not to go it alone. Uh, we're not in this alone, we're in this together, and Deanna A.K. talked about the partnerships. And for us, particularly important is our partnerships with agriculture. Uh, we have a partnership with the Palo Verde Irrigation District and Bard Water District where we pay farmers to temporarily fallow land on a rotational basis. 
We also have a partnership with Imperial Irrigation District where we fund water conservation activities in IID and the saved water comes to us here in Southern California. It took a lot of time and effort to develop those partnerships. Coming from LA, generally, for some reason, people don't trust you right off the bat. But over time, uh, working to find common interests, we've developed programs that protect the agricultural community and provide us a, water, a, re, a reliable water supply in Southern California. Today, about half of the water flowing through the Colorado River Aqueduct is from our agricultural partners transfers and half is our own contract. The other thing that's been vitally important is investing in storage. 20 years ago, we built Diamond Valley Lake at a cost of $2 billion, paid for completely by our local uh, region here in Southern California, no federal funds, and it doubled the storage in Southern California, which is very important because it's on the west side of the San Andreas Fault which is always a concern because all of our aqueducts cross the San Andreas Fault and in a big earthquake that we could lose all of them. But in addition to investing in Diamond Valley Lake, we also have creative ways to store water in Lake Mead. Knowing that Lake Mead is not likely to fill anytime soon or maybe ever, using that unused space as storage comes as a free way to, uh, to uh, a free uh, opportunity to take advantage of storage without having to build any new expensive and potentially environmentally damaging uh, projects. And finally, of course, increasing our local resilience and reducing our need for imported supplies. Metropolitan Water District, we don't fund directly these programs, but we provide financial incentives to our member agencies to do things like water recycling. About 10% of our demands here are now through recycled water projects. Cleaning up groundwater has been polluted over the years through poor chloride and other contaminants. And of course, conservation. Uh, six years ago, we, delivered the, we developed the largest turf, remo turf removal program in the country, spending $400 million to have uh, Southern Californians voluntarily take out their grass and replace it with native or low water using uh, um, uh, uh, landscape. But we, while we've been successful to this point, we know we have to do more. We know Lake Mead is projected to continue falling. And earlier today, we heard that while we don't have a great uh, idea of the forecast for next year, so far it's looking like it could be another dry year. Next slide. So the opportunities as we also enter into this big negotiations that Deanna talked about on the Colorado River for the next 20 or 30 years, we need to figure out new ways to stretch our existing supplies. One is uh, a new water recycling project that we are exploring here in Southern California. It's too large for any one of our member agencies to fund it themselves. So we as are taking a new role and potentially funding the largest recycling plant in the nation, which would recycle about 180,000 acre feet. We have expressed partners from Nevada and Arizona that are interested in funding a portion of that plant's cost and getting some of the, the, the water from that project. We'll be making a decision on that in the next couple of years. But our wastewater here in Southern California could help Las Vegas or Phoenix in the not too distant future. We now, hope that the federal government will partnership. Two minutes? Yes, thanks. Perfect. And, um, and it's also could be an example because there's more projects. We have millions of acre feet of water going into the Pacific Ocean through either wastewater projects or stormwater, those big storms that we can't catch. If we can uh, develop more of those projects, who knows? We could have partners with someone as far away as Denver that could benefit from opportunities in Southern California. So this first project will be deciding in the next two years, but it could be much more opportunities for interstate collaboration for large, uh, new large augmentation projects. Second is figuring out ways and new technology for irrigation to continue but use less water. Five states are partnering to look at new drip technology that could maybe be used throughout the basin. We also own land in the Palo Verde Irrigation District. We're trying to see if we can change the markets by uh, having lower rent for our tenants if they could grow crops that use less water. 
Right now, there's not a market for growing, say, vegetables in that region. But is there a way to incentivize and create a, a, a economical path for lower water use crops, keeping those local economies going, but recognizing that there's less water available? We have to keep agricultural product productive, but we also have to figure out how they can use less water as well. And finally, salt is an issue. The Colorado River is one of the saltier large rivers in the country. And recently the biggest project was shut down at Paradox Valley, which controlled 110,000 tons a year, prevented this hypersaline hyper groundwater from entering the Colorado River. But because of earthquake concerns in the region, that project has been turned off for two years. Why does salt matter in a drought? Well, because we in Southern California recycle water and when you recycle water, it gets saltier. And so if the source water becomes salty enough, we, we have to lose some of our recycled water opportunities. So we need water that's low in TDS, low enough in TDS so that we can fully recycle it again and reuse it. Additionally, uh, crops have to, salt will build up in the soil for irrigation uh, uh, places that irrigate. And so you then you have to leach out the salts with some extra water. So there's more water use as the salt increases. So we need to see, is there something we can do at Paradox Valley to capture that 110,000 tons, again, from, uh, from entering the river, keeping the river less salty so we continue to recycle and use less for, for irrigation. So that concludes my, uh, my talk, thank you. Thanks so much, Bill, that was great. All right, I'm going to invite the panelists for this panel to turn their cameras back on to entertain some questions from the audience. And I already have a few. Just want to remind people to, if you have a question, to put it in the questions box. Um, so the first question that I have is coming from um, Nina Hemphill. The question is for Jesse. Has there been evidence of more mosquito-borne diseases with warmer water or more drying of streams or lakes? I'm thinking more backwaters for mosquitoes to breed. I'm concerned about the north, northward migration of more southern diseases into areas where they never occurred before. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there has been, a, you know, we're starting to see more and more of some certain mosquito species um, moving further northward uh, throughout the United States. And also within that, we know that West Nile has been associated with, um, uh, which is a, a mosquito uh, transmitted disease. West Nile has been associated with changes in precipitation patterns and especially changes in, in drought conditions. Um, and even if you look back to the Zika virus outbreak that happened throughout the South Central America and came all the way up into North America, uh, one of the, there's been a number, a couple of research studies that have actually shown that that particular uh, outbreak of Zika virus that threatened the United States as well was um, potentially caused or, or ignited by a, a drought event that happened in Brazil and throughout that region. And so there's a number of uh, relationships there, especially when you're talking about drought. And a lot of times when we think of drought, we don't necessarily think of mosquitoes because you think of a wet environment, but it's going back to exactly what you said, that you see more pooling of water and you also see changes in the behavior of how people are using water as well. And pooling water or stagnant water is prime uh, conditions for a lot of mosquitoes to breed and reproduce. Also, there's been some studies that have shown that hotter and drier conditions actually cause mosquitoes to be thirstier, and so they feed on more people, which is more likely to transmit disease as well. So yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and, and it also is a, a big concern as well. Thanks, Jesse. Um, the next question is from Megan Holcomb. Uh, this question is for Chris. Is the outdoor recreation industry pursuing ways to better quantify the actual economic impact in dollars? We are seeing. I know states are struggling to report the impacts of drought to various economies, and we do need industry leaders to help take on the challenge 
of quantifying economic shortfalls, burdens between wet and dry seasons? It's a, it's a great question, and, and to my knowledge, I have not seen an economic study that's trying to quantify the impact of drought and other um, climate-related impacts on outdoor recreation. The best we have to date would be that Bureau of Economic Analysis Outdoor Recreation Satellite Account, which captures um, uh, at a, on an annual basis the, the national uh, real gross output of outdoor recreation, as well as jobs and then does that state by state analysis, but um, none that I know of that are, that are looking at this climate and, and recreation connection, it's, it's primarily anecdotal. You know, you're saying, you're hearing from businesses on Lake Powell or Lake Mead saying that their revenue stream is, is 20% less than the year prior and, and you're sort of piecing those together, but nothing that I've seen at the regional scale. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, we have a question here um, from Stephanie Conley. I'm gonna I'm gonna give this question first to um, Kevin, but invite others to answer because it wasn't identified for a particular panelist. The question is, how much awareness is there in land management that upland forests ecosystems are connected to the agricultural landscapes below? Are there efforts in planning and working with entities to link the management of the two ecosystems and maximize upstream management activities to ensure that downstream users get the most um, benefit? And I don't know, Kevin, if you want to, you know, I, I open up this to everybody here on this on this panel. Uh, but I wasn't sure if you wanted to take a stab first at this at this answer, Kevin. Oops, you're on mute. Maybe I'm the only one who can't hear you. Well, I, no, I can't. I can't. Oh, you can't hear him either. Either okay. Um, shoot. Okay. Well, um. Let, oh, oh. I'm unmuted. Oh. oh, there you are. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. So, really good question. Uh, I haven't seen uh, survey data or sophisticated research on that, on the public awareness or the interested public awareness of the connection. Uh, I think we probably uh, could learn by by adding some survey research connected to projects that are already happening. For example, Denver Waters. Uh, work uh, on, on forest to tap and looking at the health of their watershed, part of their watershed, and how that relates to water quantity and quality. Uh, what, I what I would say is that in survey research that we've done and partners have done, the level of concern about drought and its impact on daily lives is, as, is incredibly high. And while water is complex, and while some of these systems are a little bit opaque for, for most of us, you know, I know as a non-scientist, I'm learning a lot just one morning here and being challenged. Some of these things, some of these processes are opaque and difficult to grasp. That said, the interested public uh, is very interested in investments in greater water security and in the resilience of our communities and environment. The, the level of support for proposals to do that is incredibly high and I would say candidly public officials and elected officials who lean into that are going to gain a benefit if they do it in the right way. Great um, that's a great answer it's uh, you know it's it, it's often political will for these some of these solutions is often lagging and it's great to hear that probably not in this case there might be an appetite from the from the from the public to see some more innovation and kind of pushing the envelope. Bill, there is a question that came in for you from Dave Wagner, and the question is, what is the most cost-effective new water supply investment for metropolitan water? In other words, what is the cheapest new water? <laughs> well, we're, I mean, that, that cheapest new water is always tough, right? I think, uh, the cheapest water is probably um, 
I mean, we can do more to conserve water. I don't know what the price of conservation is. That that's pretty low. Um, but we've already developed most of our cheap cheap supplies. I mean, our region has used significantly less water than they have during the last drought in the 2014-2015. We're 25, 30% down from where we were there. So there's not a whole lot more that we can do that's easy. And I think that um, we're now looking at investing in the more expensive options, right? The regional recycling project is $1,800 an acre foot. Um, there are some desalination. San Diego County has a desalination program that's more than $2,000 an acre foot. So um, while it would be nice if there were some cheap options, the reality is it's going to be more expensive and more investments to shore up our reliability, especially in our local service area here where our, our focus is right now. Stormwater capture is another one that there's a potential for some water, but it's, it's not going to be cheap. So um, I think that the days of cheap water are gone. Okay, well, on that somber note, we are <laughs> going to conclude uh, this panel. So again, thank you all very much for your time and for your um, your remarks. We, um, I would like to, let's see here, we're going to take a 10 minute break at this time. Um, we do have another trivia question that will be shown during the break. Um, and I would say to everyone that we will go ahead and all return, reconvene for our last um, presentation at 2.50 p.m. Eastern Time. So we'll be back um, to finish out our day at 2.50 p.m. Eastern Time. In the meantime, here is our latest trivia question.
All right, the bells have rung. We're gonna give folks just a few more seconds to get in back into um, the forum. And then we're gonna take a look at the, the trivia question. So welcome back everyone from the break. Um, the trivia question was how many local, I'm sorry, how many total weeks the Intermountain West drought early warning system has been completely drought free since it started in 2000. So it looks like we've got, oh, let me give you the answer then. <laughs> Without further ado, since the year 2000, the Intermountain West Drought Early Warning System has had a total of 19 weeks without any drought. So 19 weeks, weeks is the winner. Um, don't have any free iPods or anything to give away, but um, all right. So the last speaker today, um, and I'm glad that we've got a great audience uh, for him. He's got a, a great presentation to share with us. The last speaker today will be Chris, Chris Gomez. Chris is from the Colorado State University. He's here to share with us his research on the impacts of drought on agriculture local economies, public health, and crime across the Western US. Chris is a professor at the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics at Colorado State University, and he holds a PhD in economics from the University of Colorado. So Chris, you are up. I think you're still on mute. I can see you, but I can't hear you. Did you unmute yourself from in the control panel? Did you unmute yourself? Well, Chris, is it possible that you have a mute on the device itself? How about this? Can you hear me there you now? Go. Yes. Okay. I, yeah. I switched microphones. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, I, I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about a, a project that um, was jointly supported by NIDIS and the Colorado Water Conservation Board. And it's entitled Assessing the Impacts of Recent Drought on Ecosystem Services Based Sectors, Criminal Activity and Health Outcomes. And it was jointly done with myself and um, Dale Manning and Jesse Burkhart, who are also in the, the Ag and Resource Econ Department at CSU, along with Alex Moss, who's a former graduate student who's now at the University of Idaho. Um, next slide. Um, just a little background and motivation that I think will highlight why we did what we did and why we think it's it's important what we did. Uh, we were approached from uh, by people from the Colorado Water Conservation Board in 2011 and 2012 to do kind of studies looking at drought impacts to Colorado. And each time we, we did those studies, they focused largely on agriculture. We kind of had to reinvent the process, the modeling effort each time we did it. And, and when they came to us in 2018 and wanted us to kind of do an analysis again, um, they also expressed a desire to kind of expand the scope of the impacts. So look beyond maybe just the economic impacts, uh, changes in revenues, uh, changes in, in jobs, and, and those sorts of things that we had looked at before. They also were hoping to make the analysis expandable, scalable to a different geographic scope or scale. Um, we are hoping to maybe look beyond just the economic impacts to agriculture, expand out to other sectors, um, look at things like the impacts to the recreation sector. And then we also want to develop a generalizable approach to estimating the impacts of, of past and, 
current and future droughts because the question was raised, well, how does 2018 compare to 2012? How does it compare to 2011? What can we expect um, these different types of conditions for the impacts to be? So next slide. And so we started with uh, kind of the general framework that these types of studies typically follow. And that is, if you start with a particular industry that's impacted, and usually it's agriculture because the connection between uh, dry conditions and agricultural product production are relatively easy to establish. And then we typically look backwards at what are the change in the inputs purchased because there's a decrease in production in agriculture. What's the change in the amount of labor employed? And typically these types of analyses would use an input output regional economic model. It's a structural economic model, which kind of takes as fixed the relationship between inputs and output in uh, agriculture production and labor and tries to draw a connection between those. The nice thing about those models is that you can isolate the impacts resulting from agriculture and how that trickles through the entire economy. But you only pick up impacts to those sectors that you can directly identify the impact of drought on economic activity in that sector. So for certain sectors where the connection might be a little less uh, obvious to identify, so for example, the impact to tourism, the impact to uh, ho hotel stays and travel, it's a little bit more difficult to use those types of models. The other thing is that those types of models only allow you to estimate changes to total revenues associated with the change in output levels. So they don't allow price to fluctuate. They don't pick up price changes. They don't pick up insurance payments that might offset some of these damages associated with the natural hazard. And they don't pick up non-revenue impacts. And what we've already heard today is that we expect and have evidence that drought impacts um, they extend beyond just economic productivity. And so we wanted to expand our analysis. Next slide. And so we moved to more of an empirical based approach. And so what we wanted to do, because we have so much data now, we took a roughly 40 years of data and we tried to answer the question, what impact does an additional month of PDSI category X, and I'll explain that in a second, have on outcome Y? And so we ran a regression analysis where Y is an outcome indicator, and it ranges from ag production and particular type of crop all the way to different health outcomes. And so we run this regression, and essentially we split um, PDSI into bins. And we use PDSI to capture the kind of um, stock of, of drought, so to speak, the longer term, the multi 18 month, the 24 month. Uh, drought event that may be happening. And we split it into four categories. Extreme drought is any PDSI less than minus three, moderate drought to minus three to minus one, moderate is wet is one to three, and extreme wet is greater than three. And so we count the number of months in a given year, and we look at how the outcome variable of interest varies depending on the number of months in each PDSI bin. We also importantly include temperature and precipitation, and some other controls, which I'll talk about in a second. I wanna point out that our analysis focused on rural counties throughout the Western United States. And importantly, later when I show you some results on the next slide, essentially what we're reporting is the impact of an additional month in each category on the outcome variable of interest. So we have 15 to 20 different outcomes that we look at, and I'll focus on some results from just a few. So let's go to the next slide. So one of the things that we looked at was agricultural production. And we did this for corn, wheat, hay, and sorghum. Those are kind of the major crops that we have data on from NAS. And so if you look at the graph on the left, it provides those coefficient estimates for PDSI. Again, we also include temp uh, temperature and precipitation to account for contemporaneous weather conditions. And when I show you simulations later, it'll also include the effects of contemporaneous temperature and precipitation. But this graph shows you on the left that a PDSI uh, of less than minus three, each additional month within a year with a PDSI of less than minus three is associated with a roughly 3% decrease in total corn production. And we see similar effects for wheat and hay. But the nice thing about this approach is we're also able to get, capture the effects of non 
normal, so to speak, conditions when it's too wet. And that's what you see on the far right of that corn production slide. So we see close to a roughly 2% um, reduction in total corn production for each additional month where the PDSI is greater than three. And I should point out that we got these cutoff points for PDSI, or we tried to mirror what's in the Colorado drought plan. With this approach, what we were able to do is also look at the heterogeneity in the effect. So that graph on the left shows you the average effect of an additional month of PDSI in each of those categories. On the right, we were able to also think about, well, how does a month of PDSI in that extreme dry category, um, how does that effect differ depending on whether or not it occurs during the growing season or the non-growing season? And so as you can see from that graph on the right, for each additional month over the course of a year during the growing season, where we're experiencing extreme drought as defined herein, we get almost a 5% reduction in total corn production. We can, again, show similar results for wheat and hay, and we also in the analysis look at the impacts not just to total production, but on harvested acre and, and, and yield per acre harvested. Carrying on with just the general ag results, we also find that temperature and precipitation are sig significant contributors to corn uh, production and harvested acreage and yields, not surprisingly. And temperature and precipitation tend to have a positive impact up on total production up to a particular point. And then those positive effects diminish as temperatures increase and become negative um, well above the mean. So we also found in the study that there's evidence, and what I mean by evidence is we couldn't draw a causal effect, but there is a correlation between income level in a particular area and the impact of drought on the agricultural economy. Specifically, we found that the impact of drought on uh, the agricultural economy is lower in counties with higher median incomes than those with lower incomes in that area. So next slide. We also looked at a wide range, a uh, wide array of employment, wage, and number of establishment impacts. And so we used uh, QCW data, quarterly census of employment and wages data, which is at the county level, and we're able to look at a variety of sectors and how employment and wages change in those sectors depending on drought conditions. And this is an example of the impact to recreation and entertainment sectors and the impact on total wages and employment. And so we heard earlier questions about what impact is there on recreation. Um, well, we found that recreation and entertainment wages decreased by approximately 6% for every additional month over the course of a year that we're in extreme drought. And employment decreases also by roughly 6%, and the number of establishments decreased by 5%. I want to point out that these results that I'm showing are short-term effects, so how the economy is responding to those drought conditions within a given year. Other areas where we found statistically significant impacts of drought on employment and wages were not surprisingly agriculture. We found that wages in agricultural supply sector fall by roughly 1.3% in crop um, um, for each additional month of extreme drought, by roughly 0.6% for each additional month of extreme drought in the livestock sector, and agricultural supply sector falls by roughly 1.2%. Um, employment does for each additional month of extreme drought. In the non-ag sectors, somewhat surprisingly, but intuitively, we found that increases in um, wages and employment occurred during drought periods in the public utility sector. So specifically uh, water and electric utilities, we found increases or benefits, so to speak, to uh, employees and, 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 and wage earners in those sectors during drought. Next slide. So in addition to identifying all of these kind of um, what I would call marginal effects, so what is the effect of an additional month on a particular outcome variable? What is the effect of different levels of precipitation? What we also wanted to do was be able to simulate using those results that we got from the re regression analysis, the impact of particular droughts. And so here what I have is the history of Palmer Drought Severity Index, the PDSI, for Otero County, Colorado from roughly 2010 to 2020. 
And the reason that we presented Otero County, or the reason I'm showing Otero County is because that was one of the counties that we did our analysis on in 2011 and 2012. And so we wanted to kind of compare the results that we got here to those previous results that we got in those earlier studies. One of the things that's nice about this is we can use those historical um, um, PDSI numbers and temp and precip to compare droughts. And so we can see that 2012 from a PDSI standpoint was more severe than 2018. And we can actually compare those, those two periods and we do that in, in, in the study. And the types of things that we can do with the simulation, if we go to the next slide, we can illustrate what we can actually see. And I'm gonna do some, I've got some animation here. So what we can do is this is a, um, um, an illustration of the, the results for Otero County, um, the effect or the impact of drought in 2018 on Otero County. And so we can both identify the proportional impact and the percent change um, due to drought conditions in that year is just 100 times the proportional impact number that you have there. So for hay production in 2018, we found that in Otero County, we saw roughly an 8% reduction due to those climate conditions in that year. Wheat production was down by about 14% and sorghum production was down by about 7%. And those were all statistically significant. We didn't see a statistically significant effect on corn production, but we did see a statistically significant effect on corn acres harvested. And so we can get this kind of detailed breakdown of the impact on different crops, harvests, and yields. Uh, next slide. We can also do this by employment category. And so for this particular drought, we're able to identify that there was roughly a 1% reduction in overall employment, and that was statistically significant. That effect wasn't statistically significant on the larger ag, fish, and hunting category that the QCEW provides, but it was significant, I don't show it here, on agricultural suppliers, a subcategory of that, that ag, fish, and hunt category. Interestingly enough, we found that there was a statistically significant and negative effect on the recreation and entertainment sectors of about 2.5% reduction in total employment. We can also see the breakdown of the wage bill that is, play, uh, is paid um, um, to employers. And you also see that there's a negative and statistically significant recreation and entertainment effect um, because of those conditions in that year. And that also extends to services, retail and wholesale and the utilities and construction sector. And again, this is combining all of the climatic conditions in that year, the PDSI as well as the temp and precip. Next slide. Again, we extend this analysis out beyond just kind of the impact to ag production and the impact to employment in the wage bill. And we look at the impact on insurance payments where we found a statistically and significant increase in the amount of inde the, the indemnity payment, uh, payments to that county. And also we found a statistically and positive effect on total revenue and total taxes paid. Part of that, increase in total revenue is the fact that we're accounting for that increase in the indemnity paid out um, due to insurance policies held in that category, in that county. Next slide. So all of the results that I just showed really focus on kind of the short-term responses of the economy or a particular outcome variable to um, PSI conditions, temper, uh, temp and precip conditions in that particular year. We know that people also make adjustments to their behavior that have longer term impacts on how the economy functions, but we don't know a ton about how that um, impact um, uh, relates to those short term oscillations. We've been working on some research with a graduate student and his name's Joey Bloomberg. He's a student at uh, in our PhD program at CSU. He's an outstanding student. And he's been kind of looking at the long term impacts of certain severe drought on agricultural producers. Next slide. And so just to give you a look at what, what this analysis um, covers, is essentially we started with a focus on Colorado and specifically the water division one in Colorado. So you can think about that as the northeast corner of Colorado. And as you can see, the top part of that graph is monthly PDSI. 
And you can see that around 2000, there was a severe drought. It rivaled the 1950s drought in the 1960s and some others. But the graph below that is what we refer to as call frequency. So that's the amount of calls uh, that were placed on water rights. And so you can see a dramatic shift starting in around 2000, carrying on through 2010. And that was a result of two things that happened. First, there was this historic drought that happened in 2002, and that led or was combined with a change in how water rights were administered. So when we think about what are the longer term impacts, not of climate change, but of particular events, of particular severe droughts, we, we can kind of combine that together with these institutional changes that are happening and maybe in response and partly in response to these severe droughts and look at how that impacts producers' behaviors. So next slide. So we can simulate some of this. And so what this has is on the vertical axis is the probability of a call. And on the horizontal axis is the proportion of water received. So this, if you have a water right on the vertical axis, what's the probability that you get called out over the course of a year? And then on the horizontal, what's the proportion of your water right that you get? And we can simulate, again, this is an empirical estimate. So this is a simulation of the increase in expected yield if you were to adopt sprinkler technology, for example. And so that yellow area shows the highest area, uh, the highest range of probability of call and proportion of water received that you would benefit from the adoption of sprinkler technology. And we can overlay that with, if you go to the next slide, what we identified as our treatment and control groups. So we looked at that 2002 drought and we identified a treatment group. And those were producers who experienced the highest shock in 2002. So relative to what was expected in 1950, based on 1950 or 1960s or any other drought period, which producers had the highest unexpected shock in the 2002 drought, which is that period beyond 2002. And we can see that based on where they lie in 1950 to 1965, they're outside of that yellow area. Next slide. And even if we look at the 1965 to 1980 period, they're outside of that yellow area. But then, next slide, when we move to the reliability and probability of the call and their water rights based on the period 2000 and 2015, our simulation shows that they fall right into that area that would benefit the most from an increase in expected yield. So again, this is just simulations. We wanted to test this empirically with data that we actually have. And so if you go to the next slide, what do we see? On the top left corner, we see the estimate of the impact of being in that treatment group post 2002 on the number of flood acres that you have in production. And you can see starting in 2005, if you're in that group, there's a negative and statistically significant effect on the amount of flood acres. In the top right corner, there's a negative and statistically significant, a positive and statistically significant effect on sprinkler acres. And in the bottom right, it shows that the effect on total acres was not statistically different from zero. So we run a different bunch of different models and the results are fairly robust to this. What we see is this unexpected shock, which led was combined with an institutional change, had a permanent effect of transitioning producers, not removing acres from production, but transitioning from them from flood to sprinkler. So this type of effect is also a result, a long, longer term effect of droughts that we experience. And it's not taken into account in those previous numbers that we show necessarily. So with that, um, I'm going to um, end my talk and I'll be open for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. All right. Um, let's take a look and see what we have in the questions box. And I don't... Um, Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and take the liberty of asking a question as the yeah. moderator. So um, I'm kind of curious, how is this information, how is this data 
that you are um, creating through this analysis, um, do you know how it's being used by the state um, in terms of its mitigation strategies or different strategies that they're going to be employing um, in the future? Does, did, I know you provided this was done in, in consultation with the CWCB, and I was just kind of curious if you have any insights on how they are utilizing this information. Is it changing their strategies? I don't know if it's it's necessarily uh, changing strategies. I think that, that that's a really good question. And, and Viva, I wonder you should be answering this because you've worked with the state in the past about how these drought impact studies actually um, um, uh, change uh, policy. Um, I think in the past, historically, they've largely been used to document the problem okay. and to potentially uh, point people towards resources that are available. Um, but but I think we're so that that to my knowledge is is how it's used. Okay. All right. Um, we did get a question in the chat box uh, or in the questions box. Sorry. Um, someone is asking, how do you define drought? In oh, I'm sorry. How applicable are these results outside of the state of Colorado? Uh, so good question. We actually did this model for uh, using data from the entire Western United States. And so those coefficient estimates, uh, we, we, we'd call average effects. So the, the roughly 4% reduction in corn production, for example, per month of extreme uh, drought, um, that's an average effect across the West. We also would run the model separately on just the, the initial focus of the study was on Colorado, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. And so we can subset the, the data into just those states. And, and the effects are largely robust to however we kind of subset the data down to states. So that's kind of the average effect uh, across the entire West. Okay. Uh, and it remains fairly constant. Okay, all right. Um, we have another question here from Mark Svoboda, who's asking, he's wondering um, though, if you would have had better results, especially for ag correlations, given the inherent nine month lag of the PDSI. He goes on to say, I know that it is in the Colorado state plan, but, uh, but may not be the best indicator for some of these applications. SPEI is flexible and accounts for both temperature and precip. Yeah, so so good question. And, and we, we tried a variety of different measures, including SPEI. And what we were actually hoping to do was differentiate between contemporaneous conditions in a particular year, uh, temp and precip data that we had, uh, from kind of a, a longer term trend within the region. And so that's why we kind of settled on uh, PDSI as that kind of 18 month kind of um, lagging indicator of, of how we got there. And so we include both of those in the analysis. And so the result that I showed was for a month in a particular PDSI category, we also are including temp and precip in the model, um, and 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 so it, it it was it was rather robust to alternative um, indicators that we put in there. Um, okay. Okay. Um, someone's asking. Nina Hemp Hill is asking. Are the results of your Western analysis available? Yeah. So the the study is available on. Uh, NIDIS's website. You can also reach out to me if you'd like a, a, a copy. I can uh, present that to you. Um, that was for a comparison of 2018 to 2012. And um, But I want to throw this out there. This, this research is kind of ongoing. And one of the nice things about this research is that if you identify a particular county or a particular region in a particular year, it's relatively straightforward to just plug those numbers in to the model output to simulate another drought. Okay, that was going to be one of my questions: is whether or not you could use the 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 methodology um, to kind of look at potential scenarios in the out years of drought. So if you were to combine what was discussed earlier today about what the climate will look could potentially look like in the future, you could use this methodology to give you some insights as to what those impacts would be, economic impacts would be. It, it, exactly. The one caveat being that we anticipate 
some type of adaptation, some sort of some right. type of mitigation strategies. And that that's kind of what we saw in response to that 2002 event, which really changed people's expectations about the reliability of their water rights. Um, we we with the current with with that current analysis, we split the sample, and again, those those uh, impact estimates are fairly robust. Whether we look at the last 20 years or the previous 20 years, but when projecting out kind of potential impacts of climate change, we do anticipate some sort of adaptation, some sort of response by producers and economies, and so we would expect the impacts that we get um, from this analysis. Uh, looking out into the future to be to be probably uh, overestimate overestimates because they wouldn't account for any sort of uh, Adapt adaptation. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. All right. Um, and we have one more question before we end this Q and A. This is from Tony Willardson. Tony's asking: Is there an inflection point where agriculture is no longer economically viable? Do, do your studies indicate any evidence of changes in water use? It, for example, add to urban or add to environmental use? No, no, we, we're, we're not able to, in this particular analysis, we, we weren't able to and we didn't identify a threshold point beyond which agriculture would leave, for example, the region. Uh, so we, we didn't analyze that. And again, we restricted our analysis, especially on the ag production, to just rural counties that had ag production in them. And so looking at when they would switch over, um, uh, we, we didn't do that and we weren't able to. Although I know that type of threshold analysis is, is of significant interest to, to a lot of people. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the Q&A session. Um, and we are now in the closing um part of today i just want to say thank you again to all of the the panelists uh for their excellent presentations tomorrow um just to kind of set us up for tomorrow we will be asking the question do more opportunities exist more opportunities to change to adapt to evolve for uh to what the future may portend um, this idea of the new paradigm shift that is happening in the Southwest. We will explore ongoing efforts to address drought in the Southwest and identify gaps and recommended pathways to greater collaboration. Tomorrow, we're gonna have two expert panels. The first is a state, local government, and uh, NGO panel on managing for a changing climate in the Southwest. The second will be a federal panel um, with uh, will be focusing on federal government initiatives to address long term drought resilience in the southwest. We also will have our first of two breakout planned breakout groups. Um, the one tomorrow will be focusing on asking what would be tangible indicators of success if we were working as a nationally integrated and coordinated system. What would it look like at the local, state, federal, tribal, and business levels? The breakout groups tomorrow will use Google Meet. Each of you should have received a calendar invitation with a link to your assigned breakout group or breakout room, I'm sorry. If you did not receive this calendar invitation with a link, please drop a message in the questions box so that we can assign you to one of the breakout groups. Um, finally, uh, I would like to end today's um, day one of the forum with one final question. What is one takeaway that you took from today? And if you uh, can put that into a word or two, please go ahead and drop your answer to that question in the questions box. And we will um, gather up all of those responses and share some common themes that emerged from these answers um, at the beginning of tomorrow, day two of the forum. So again, uh, what is your one takeaway from today's day one of the forum? And if you could put your answer in the questions box, that would be great. This now officially concludes day one of the forum. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time, 10 a.m. Central time, 9 a.m. Mountain time, and 8 a.m. Pacific time. Thank you all again.